Hi guys, Veggie Gamer back, and we are starting the Prisoner of Azkaban Harry Potter J.K. Rowling. That isn't what it's called. Veggie Knights. Uh, really looking forward to this. My goodness, I really am, guys. You guys say this is where the big, the big changes happen, but also a lot of you guys say this is your favourite book out of all of them, guys. And so. Really looking forward to it. We're covering four chapters today, guys, because at the start of the book, a lot of it is last year, Harry, and all that sort of stuff, so there isn't really much for me to, like, you know, delve into, and so we are starting off with four chapters. It is, it is, it is Owl Post, Aunt Marge's Big Mistake, the, the Night Bus, and... I can't remember. And the fourth chapter. Oh, no. Come on, Veggie. You know this. You know the name of the fourth chapter. The Leaky Cauldron! There we go. And you may notice, very nice, that we have a new feature here. So i got to give a massive shout out to Jonas, also known as Me Than Output, which I'm always sure I'm saying incorrectly. Very often in the book cl clubs, which, we, we, which are at the end of the videos, guys, and also can be found in the comments. But they very kindly put these together, guys, and I think this is absolutely amazing. So, um, it's basically uh, AI-generated images for each chapter. And so, as you can see, we have uh, our post highlighted there. Then it will be flicking on to the next one and the next one. And then we do have the fourth one as well. Um... I just couldn't remember the name of the chapter because I'm, I'm using that to remember what the name of them were. But um, but yes, thank you so much, Jonas. I it it looks too professional for my YouTube channel, quite frankly, because usually my things are very very basic. But look how good that looks, though. And so thank you so much, Jonas. Hugely appreciate it. Um, I think it looks great. And so another new feature um, to, to to the videos. Uh, so yes, like I say, we're going to be starting Prison of Azkaban. If you're new here, guys, because I know that we, we, we've we um, started the uh, Very Potter Musical on the YouTube channel, so it's very possible that some of you may be new here. Basically, we do a deep dive review into, uh, into the Harry Potter books, guys. It's obviously my first time experiencing them. And uh, we break down each chapter. Like I say, we're doing four in today's uh, video. Um, and yes, we we uh, we then discuss the differences and and, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, things that the that's the things that the movie did really well. Things that could have been done differently. And there's definitely some things that the movie did very well uh, in these first chapters. Also, some big things which would have been nice to have in a bit. You can't have everything in a movie though. But and then at the end of it. We then do the Harry Potter book club, which is basically where you get to be a part of these videos as well, guys. And so we'll cover the four chapters. And then at the end, I go through a blog, uh, which is posted on the Patreon, of your comments about these chapters. And so um, it could be a question about what I think about certain things, or it could be uh, uh, something that, that you've noticed about it, or just your opinion on different moments. It could be whatever you want, guys, on, on the chapters that, that, we're, that we're covering. And so if you want to be a part of that, you can back the Patreon for as little as you want and get access to everything that's on there. There's no tier system or anything, so you can pay as little as you want and you get to be a part of this book club as well. Another benefit of the Patreon is that you get, uh, we're always at least two book review episodes ahead on the Patreon than, than, than the ones which are uh, available free on YouTube. Uh, that being said, if you can't back the Patreon, don't worry guys, all these things will be coming to YouTube for free eventually. But if you want to if you want to get it like, if you get to the latest one and you think, oh, I kind of fancy uh, you know, catching up with the, with the later episodes, then you can do by just backing the Patreon if you wish. And then also you get up to be a part of the book club. But like I say, you don't need to if, if you don't want to, guys. This stuff will be coming to free on the YouTube channel as always. I think that's all the housekeeping, guys. I don't think I've got any notes left over from Chamber of Secrets. Thoroughly enjoy Chamber of Secrets, guys. Well, let's not go into it again. <laughs> we went into it so much in the last episode. But Ginny uh, did get done, done dirty in, in the movie. But hopefully that is less the case in Prisoner of Azkaban. She's not really in Prisoner of Azkaban much, is she? I actually can't remember. Well, she's not in these first four chapters much anyway. And so let's get on to... Uh, yes, I think that's all the, uh, the housekeeping. Let's get on to uh, chapter one of The Prisoner of Azkaban. Uh, I'll post. As always, massive shout out to Raider Max for doing the summaries for these chapters, guys. It really does save me a lot of time, and so uh, he, he does the summaries, and then um, and then I I do my notes afterwards. But uh, him doing the su su summaries 
really appreciate because it really speeds up my process. So here we go, uh, at chapter one, Owl House of Post of Ascan. Very, very excited. And as you can see, Owl House, uh, Owl House, Owl Post is highlighted right there. Uh, we start with Harry in his room writing an essay in secret at midnight during, uh, due to the Dursley's views on the Wizarding World. It approaches Harry. It's approaching Harry's birthday, but he is not ex excited because he is not expecting any gifts or letters since he hasn't received any letter all summer. Ron very poorly attempted to call Vernon, claiming that there was no, and Vernon claimed that there was no Harry who lived there and to never call again. Much as Harry's, much to Harry's surprise, he does indeed get some birthday gifts from his friends. He also receives a great, great news that the Weasleys have won a draw, um, a draw at the Ministry, giving them a um, a big chunk of money and a picture of their, their entire family, in, including Scrabbers, in each. Um, the gifts uh, he got were a broomstick kit from Hermione, a sneakoscope from Ron that keeps going off because of Fred and George, and a literal monster book from Hagrid. The last bit of news he gets comes from McGonagall stating his supply list for the year and permission slip to Hogsmeade that needs to be signed by a parent or guardian. Harry went to bed happy for the first time all summer. So thank you so much for, for the summary, uh, Max. They are greatly appreciated. So yeah, Harry really hates summer, guys. And it's interesting um, that... It's it's really it's still put over about how miserable Harry's life is with the Dursleys at this point because in the movie, what we cover in these first two chapters, let's see the t first two chapters because I do think that the movie did very well in, in certain parts. It doesn't put over the misery that Harry is still going through quite as much. Whereas even even before Marge comes in, it's really saying how Harry really really hates summer and the fact that it's it's his birthday tomorrow, but he's not not getting his hopes for anyone to to get to get him anything. And then you had this wonderful payoff at the end of the chapter where you know his reliable friends have actually got him stuff. His first ever Christ, uh, birthday card, I should say. He would have he would have received Christmas cards, but not birthday cards. Um. And so that's really nice that, that it put that over. He's doing the, his homework in secret, guys, which, again, wasn't something that I really... I think the movie did do very well with this stuff, but I, when watching it, didn't pick up on it. Because I'll say Harry's, like, um, tried, tried to read his book. I thought he was actually trying to do a book that, that, that was in... A, a spell that was actually in the book, in the movie version, but he wasn't. He was just trying to turn, turn, the, turn the light on, on his wand. Loomis Mac Maximus. Um, and in the movie, um, Vernon keeps on like popping in and like w going back out again. Um, so yeah, that's something which there's several parts of this where I thought, oh, that's different. And then when I refresh myself with the movie, there's absolutely there, but it's very, very subtle. One thing that we'll get to <coughs> in chapter two, I'm already jumping around, but in chapter two with uh, Petunia is that she kind of hates it when Marge comes around because... She she always brings um, a dog, or is it always? Um, oh no, it's not Snapper. I can't remember. Oh, we'll we'll, we'll get to it. We'll we'll get to it. it I I've got it in in my um in my in my notes, but uh, but yes, and and you can see in the movies she's like, <laughs> I really like frustrated by the fact that this dog is coming in there and wrecking her immaculate carpets and all this sort of thing. And so that's, that's the sort of thing which I didn't notice at all until I read, uh, I, 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 well, listened to the audiobook and then watched the scene again. These things are there, but they're just very, very subtly done in what is an incredibly fast sequence compared to uh, how long the book really dwells on, um, on, on Marge's, uh, visit but we'll get to it still in chapter one betty we're still in chapter one so um yes he's doing he's doing research about blooming witches guys which i find fascinating i have been wondering because it's it, with a lot of these things you have to think about what what that actually means for the rest of the world like if magic's real then what does that mean about religion and stuff like that you know uh, but also you know actual events with what were apparently real witches, and so apparently that the, the vast majority of 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 people that that were burnt at the stake and everything um, back in uh, medieval times um, weren't witches, which is like 
horrifying. You wonder that maybe they, they started doing it because... No, you see, I think this would be a bit distasteful, but if, if, the, if the book was to suggest that people started to burn witches because a real witch did something, that would really justify what was an, a, a horrendous thing that happened in real history. And so it really puts over the fact that... In fact, in fact I think that Harry's paper is actually called uh, Why burning witches in the 14th century was pointless it was completely pointless yes i've got it rain down there um and so yeah i don't think that witch burning was started by a real occurrence i mean it was always out of paranoia and stupidity and so um it's very interesting that we hear about that um and so apparently when um when witches were actually caught um they would just like put put a spell on the fire to not make to not make it burn them and it would actually tickle them and everything we hear about uh Wendelin the weird uh who, in who enjoyed it so much that she did it 47 times <laughs> which is amazing um of course the other technique was a uh, dunking them under water wasn't it and wizards and witches can drown in this universe hence why harry needed um uh, I was going to call him Longbottom then. Neville. <laughs> Needed Neville's um, trick to give himself gills and everything. Although, I can't remember if they all did it, but I know that, um, oh, the French girl, I can't remember her name at this moment. I apologise. But at least she had like a an air bubble thing, didn't she? But then again, that's visual though, isn't it? Yeah. Anyway. There's food for thought anyway, what would actually happen with, um, if, if they were using the dunking technique with witches. So I've actually written down the note here that when, um, because I didn't know the name was of all these spells at, at the point of watching the movie and everything, I thought that Harry was reading the book and then trying to do whatever spell, um, was written there. But no, in, in the movie and in the book, he is, he's using the spell to just light up so he can actually, actually read what the book says. But he's really trying to do it silently. And in the movie, it's nice, guys, because, like, Vernon's coming in and, like, Harry's, like, almost laughing to himself, where, like, you know, in, in bed pretending to be asleep and everything, which is nice. It, that, that's a choice which I, I do appreciate because it definitely gives that, like, you know, that teenager -y vibe, which is really, you know, Prince of Azkaban is really where that really kicks in. Um, but in the movie, in, in the book, he's a lot more down and just, like, worried about... The Dursleys knowing that he, that he's up to it because all this stuff is locked away, um, which isn't something that, that that that's covered in, in in the movie at all. It's actually underneath the stairs where, where he used to sleep. sleep. Um, but at some point, like like when the Dursleys like go out to look at their new car and talk very loudly so the neighbors can hear, Harry would sneak down and like you know nab some stuff out of uh, underneath the stairs and then take it back up for him to be able to do his homework he's actually keeping his homework underneath like a uh, a floorboard in fact so he's definitely trying to do things a lot more stealthy in the book and like not let the dursleys know that he's up to anything um it mentions again how the dudley uh, the, the dursley sorry are, are his only living relatives it does make me think that what about grandparents but then again we knew what happened in Deathly Hollows when Voldemort was going around and what Hermione had to do to her parents. Um, and what, you know, in the edited scene, in the deleted scene, what Harry gets the Dursleys to do, actually move house and everything. Um, and so you'd probably imagine that Voldemort maybe uh, got got to the grandparents first. But I'll be interested to see if that's ever covered. I think it probably will be with Lily. Because obviously with, with Petunia and Lily, um, we've already heard about the fact that they were so, so proud of uh, of Lily and so on. Um, but on James's side, I don't think we've heard Jack about. Is his name Jack Potter? Um, yeah, Jack Potter. That would be great. I hope, I hope that Harry's grandfather on his father's side is called Jack Potter, guys. Because that would make me very happy. <laughs> But anyway, yes, we shall see, we shall see. The great things about the books is that you really can go into that detail. But as it stands at this moment, we have not gone into anything about grandparents, aside from the fact that we know that Petunia's parents, um, we know we know their reaction to finding out that Lily was a witch. Um, 
But yeah, we shall see if that, if that gets any further. So the Dursies are really scared about anyone finding out about Hogwarts. And I wonder, guys. I wonder if if they're worried about it because they don't want the, pu the publicity and they just want to have a normal life just pretending that the Wizarding World just doesn't exist. Or is there some sort of contract thing where because they are Harry's harry's um guardians does the ministry then get in contact with them and say hey by the way if you let it slip about the wizarding world we're gonna be on you like a ton of bricks maybe you know maybe like you know shortly after harry was dropped off um at their house um private drive um if, if the Ministry then... Because the Ministry would have had to have got in contact with them at that point. Right? Because Hogwarts and, and, the, uh, and the professors are the ones who go and speak with, um, with muggle-born students as parents. They, like, turn up the year before their first year at Hogwarts, I believe. And tell you, hey, your, your, your daughter is a witch or your son is a, is a wizard. Here's the lowdown. Here's the scoop. But in that conversation, there has to be a, hey, by the way, you are not allowed to let this slip. Now, granted, maybe there's some sort of alarm system where, like, they think, oh, Vernon's going to go tell him. And then they send, like, a, 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 an agent over there and, like, wipe his memory or something. And then take Harry out of there. I want to know your guys' opinions on this. The legal side of a muggle who is allowed to know about the wizarding world because they're a guardian of a uh, of a wizard or witch what the legal aspect is around because the dursleys wouldn't want the dursleys wouldn't let it slip at all so in a way they're a bad example um but okay let's let's look at like this then petunia as a child what would what would stop her telling her friends at school in the muggle school that my sister's a witch out of resentment for Lily what would stop that from being possible because you have to remember there are a lot of muggle born students which means a lot of muggles who are related to to, to wizards and witches are they allowed to let their extended family know? Are they allowed to let their cousins, their, 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 the grandparents, are they are they allowed to, to know? Or is it just the, the, the you know, direct first, you know, the, the first, first circle of family? It's a terrible way of putting it, but you know what I mean. Man, I haven't even got that in my notes, and that's actually a fascinating point. What is the legality? Because legality? it has to be like legality, guys. It can't, they're not all going to be exactly like the Dursleys who want to who genuinely want to pretend that the wizarding world just doesn't exist there's gonna be and it granted if someone was to come out and say wizards and witches are real they're gonna look like an idiot and get laughed at and possibly even put away <laughs> you know but if someone can then prove it to like a journalist, oh, oh man this is all I don't know if this will ever get covered guys but this this is I, I want to know what you think? Is there something that that the that Vernon and Petunia had to sign re regarding the, the, the Ministry of Magic to secrecy, and something that all and Hermione's parents as well? I want to know your thoughts on that, guys. Uh, let's move on though, because I'm, I'm I'm waffling. But that's that, that's only just struck me right now how interesting a dilemma that is. Uh, so Harry's working on a shrinking potion for Snape's, um, for Snape's, uh, class. Never, I don't, can't think of a situation, a moment where shrinking potions ever used in the movies, but we might get that covered in the, in the books. Um, Ron telephones, like, like Max said in, in, in the summary, t Ron attempts to phone, well, I say attempt, he did it successfully. Obviously Arthur gave him the lowdown on how to use uh, the telephone. And he's like screaming down the phone, much like my mother used to do. <laughs> Uh, because he thinks that he has to do that for for, for the, the telephone to work. 
which is quite insulting to muggles in a way. He's thinking, oh, this muggle technology, I'm going to have to shout my way down it. It's not going to be able to just transfer my voice properly. And so Rod's bellowing down the phone and Vernon's having to, like, hold it at a distance and everything. Um, that's, it says, like, Rod's shouting um, down the line as if they were talking from, e from either end of a football field, which is a great image of Rod and Vernon doing that. Um... And Vernon, like, get, is furious at it. I'd imagine partly because he's being screwed at, but also because his his phone line is being used by wizarding folk. Um, and so he likes says, don't come near my family, which is pretty blooming strong. And that's it. That's, that's the only phone call that, that Harry, that, that is attempted to be given to Harry. Harry does theorise that um, Hermione probably would have phoned him. But Ron had probably told uh, Hermione not to do it because of what happened with Vernon. And it says that, uh, you know, and Harry does think how um, Hermione would probably be able to do a better job than Ron when it comes to, you know, hiding the fact that, 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 knows, that, that she knows how to use a telephone and everything and they're not be supposed to the fact that, they're, that, that, that she's a wizard or witch. I don't know if that would make any difference um, if they would ever take if Vernon or Petrina would ever take phone calls for Harry, but but the fact that Ron exposed himself as clearly not knowing what how to use a telephone obviously, obviously was alarm bells for, for, for Vernon as well. And so, yes, Harry uh, does assume that that's why Hermione hasn't phoned. But I, I do like the, the narrative that... Because we do find out that that is why Hermione didn't phone. But I do like the idea that Ron told her not to do it with the preface of, hey, I phoned... Uh, completely normally, didn't get anything wrong, and Vernon still got angry. So the fact that Rod still thinks that that's how you use the telephone. <laughs> I presume that's the case, guys, because Vernon wasn't saying, why are you talking so loudly? So Rod, I think that uh, as far as Rod's considered, the phone call was like you know, a complete success, apart from that he wasn't able to talk to Harry, but he, he used the phone in the exactly right way that he's meant to. And so when telling Hermione, he's like saying, hey, I did a great job, and I wasn't even able to talk to Harry. <laughs> so that's what I presume happened there, which makes me laugh. Um, so Vernon finally allows Hedwig to come out at night. Yes, yeah, so Hedwig is allowed out at nights now, guys. Now, this is a big difference because Hedwig is just... Hedwig is in the room at the start of, uh, of Prisoner of Azkaban, the movie, and we don't have Hedwig going off for reasons which we will discuss. But when, at the end of chapter two, when Harry leaves the house, uh, he's not meant to e even know, he's not really meant to know where Hedwig is at all. Well, he, he has a rough idea, but he doesn't know exactly where Hedwig is, I, I should say. Uh, whereas in the movie, he just, he simply just leaves Hedwig in his room, I think. We shall see. Because I will be, um, I will be revisiting the, the movie scenes as we go through today. But yeah, um, so yes, uh, Hedwig is allowed out at night. Harry has had to promise uh, to to not send letters and everything. Obviously, that doesn't last too long. But I'm glad that that at least Hedwig is allowed out of, out of the cage um, at nights now. It's interesting because Vernon is in these chapters. He's certainly not nicer. But there is a balance of, you scratch my back, I'll stick a knife in yours, you know? There is a dialogue going on, which we shall get to later on. And it is in the movie, guys, but it's so much more fleshed out in the, in, in the, uh, in the book uh, regarding that Hogsmeade letter. We will get to that, though. Um, but yes. Uh, yes, yeah, so he's hiding everything under uh, under the floorboards, like I like I mentioned earlier. It's Harry's birthday again, which is obviously um, has it. We didn't have Harry's birthday in the first book, did we? We had uh, Dudley's birthday, but not Harry's, I don't think. Uh, which obviously we then did in Chamber of Secrets, but no, when when Marge. Is it the same day that Marge turns up? Or well, basically. Where we start off in the book is turning over to midnight for Harry's birthday to to begin, um, which is uh, certainly not something which is covered in in the movie. Um, 
So Hedo Hedwig's been actually gone for two days at this point, but Harry's not worried at all because apparently that's actually quite normal. And so Hedwig, so Harry can actually do quite a lot with Hedwig at, at this point. Um, I guess the Dursleys don't even check that, Hedwig, that Hedwig's coming out back at night, or maybe they don't really care. I, I, again, there is a certain level of trust with Vernon now, saying, yeah, you can let it out, but not send any letters. And then just leave Harry to his own devices. I'm not. I'm not saying that Vernon's a nice guy, guys. This probably sounds like I am. You know what it is. When I was going over these notes and rewatching the movie scenes just now, I was thinking. I really like to look at the story from the Dursleys' point of view. That's not because I agree with it at all, obviously. But I, I enjoy it. I enjoy looking at the story from the other side of the coin. Um, and so Vernon is definitely, there, there's definitely a little bit more, not respect, that's certainly the wrong word, but a lot more negotiation going on, or blackmail, as you might be referring to it later on in this chapter. But yes. Uh, very little backstory about Chamber of Secrets at this, at this point, I, I did note. There's nothing about, you know, the, the Basilisk or Tom Riddle or anything like that. It's giving us the lowdown on Harry's parents and stuff like that, but nothing specifically about Chamber of Secrets. We do get it a little bit later on with Ginny, but, uh, but yeah, Chamber of Secrets not being mentioned as much as, uh, the Philosopher's Stone was at the start of the Chamber of Secrets, at, at least at this point. So yes, then three owls fly into uh, Harry's room, which is obviously something which is not covered in in the in the in the movie. Um, uh, one of them being held up by the other two turns out to be Errol. Love love that Errol's getting more screen time here. Um, a large package package tied to his to, to its to his, to his leg, uh, which I did think was. I always assume that the owls are always holding something, but when you tie something onto an animal, that seems a little bit more not as kind. <laughs> but uh, but yes, this package actually tied onto to Errol. I guess maybe the Weezies are thinking because Errol is such a klutz uh, that maybe he he would you know leave it somewhere like accidentally or forget about it or uh, deliver it to the wrong person or something. And so it's actually tied on onto uh, Errol's leg. Uh, Hedwig is also one of the owls holding another parcel. Uh, it says a, a handsome a tawny owl is there with a Hogwarts letter. I presume that's a Hogwarts, Hogwarts' own owl. I'd imagine they've got a bunch. What's a flock of owls called? Do you get flocks of owls? I don't think you do. Flock of owls. I don't think you get flocks of owls. Um, flock of owls. Oh, Parliament! I did know that. I did. I did know that. I apologise. It's a Parliament of owls. Uh, I'd imagine that Hogwarts do have a Parliament of owls. What's the really cool one? Ravens is a um, a, no, a, a murder of crows. A murder of crows is a gr is a group of crows, and a oh, what what is Raven? It's blood something, isn't it? Flock of ravens. Unkindness! That's the really cool one. I love that. Yeah, an unkindness is a group of ravens. That's so cool. That's so... I love that sort of thing. Anyway, enough about that. But we're learning. We're learning together today. Um, and yes, Harry gets his first ever birthday card, and it is from the Weasleys, guys. He obviously gets one from Hermione as well. I'm not sure if Hagrid gives a, a card as well, but uh, Hermione does as well. Um... Uh, this is actually where we get the Daily Prophet cutting. And so in the movie, we see it briefly in the uh, League of Cauldron. Um, but uh, I guess Ron, or maybe just the Weasleys as a family, sent him this copy of uh, of the cutting of uh, Arthur Weasley winning the Grand Pies um, gallon draw um, and paid for a trip to Egypt, which is so nice. I, I, I really like that. That because it's a lot of money. I think it equates to it's several. Fa it's quite a few s s thousand pounds worth, I think. Um, that it equates to, um, which obviously would go a long way for paying for Ron's wand. Of course, what happened to it last time? Um, 
and you know, Ginny's stuff, and you know, and you know, they still have three other uh, children at Hogwarts as well. But the fact that they decide to spend the money, the main chunk of the money, on going to see to visit Bill as a family, um, I'd imagine. I think Charlie's there as well. And no, no, it is the entire family that that is there in the photo. So that's really nice, and it must be really nice for Harry as well to see that to see that that them all together, obviously. Which you'll imagine is a rare occurrence. Um, Ron apologizes for, for the phone call and everything. That, like he says how they are in Egypt and like uh, going around like the um, the pyramids and everything, and how there are like Egyptian curses and so on, like you know, seeing bodies which have grown extra heads and everything. I believe that there actually are meant to be curses on in certain I don't think the pyramids, because I don't think you can go into the pyramids at all. Right, I'm not sure. Uh, be fascinating. Um, but there are curses on certain areas in Egypt for people who aren't from Egypt to go to. Unless they just told the English that, because obviously the English went in there and just took a lot of stuff. But um, but yes, I, I like the fact that Egyptian curses are being brought up. We also hear about France as well in a minute from Hermione as, as well. And it's really nice to hear about this stuff now. Because in the movies, for me at least, the first time you think, oh wow, the world is, has all this thing and like the, it's different traits, different like approaches to magic and everything, was Goblet of Fire. Um, so to hear about this sort of thing, like you know, e Egyptian wizards and like French wizards and everything, having these different uh, cultures, it, I really like that. It really makes the world seem a lot more fleshed out, you know? Uh, so yes, the Weasleys have, uh, well, at least are going to be buying uh, Ron's new wand in, in Diagon Alley. Uh, Ron actually says about meeting up with them uh, there if, if he's able to. Um, and he, he, if he ends the, the, the card with "Don't let the Muggles get you down," which is, I think, is is potentially a reference to a slightly ruder term, which is "Don't let the, uh, you know, the B words." <laughs> don't let the bees let you down not bees but you know what I mean um, and yes asks for Harry to join them in, in, in London uh, Percy's now the head boy which is awesome I was delighted for him but you know a lot of people are making big fun of him they really are uh, but he's but he's not let, but he's not letting them get him down though which is which I, I like about it um, we don't actually know who the head boy was before Percy do we in Chamber of Secrets and um, Philosopher's Stone. There's no mention of a head boy or girl. It's no, I'm, I swear there isn't. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I swear we did not hear, not hear about the previous head girl uh, or, or boy at Hogwarts in the years that Harry, Ron and Hermione have been there. Um, and... Uh, Percy's like got a head boy badge. That he's like, you know, really showing off everything. Apparently it's actually in the photograph, but he's like pinned it to his fez that he's wearing in the picture in Egypt, which is amazing. Uh, so yes, Harry d d uh, does get a present from uh, from Ron, which appears to be uh, like a spinning top. It's a pocket sne sneaker scope. And it goes off whenever anyone who is untrustworthy or is doing something untrustworthy is near them. Uh, Bill says that it's rubbish, that it's just sold to tourists. Um, and says that, that it's always just going off. But that is most likely because uh, Fred and George are always up to something. Putting beetles in this soup, which is horrible. Um, but yes, so Fred, it's, it's actually kind of like an anti-Fred and George tool. So no wonder Ron thought that that would be an appropriate you know, gift. Percy could do with a few of them. Um, he really could, actually. Uh, but yeah, so that's what he gets from from, from uh, the Weasleys rather than, I guess, just Ron. Uh, Hedwig was pa carrying a parcel from Hermione. Um, uh, very interestingly, Hermione brings up cus customs, as in, like, custom exile. Uh, uh, what, what it was called. Um... About like delivering things via customs and post and everything like that. There doesn't seem to be an equivalent. And so obviously we, we have owls, which is one thing. But you know, Hermione doesn't have an owl. And so for people that families that don't have owls, 
there is no wizarding post equivalent, which you would kind of think that there would be, because considering what we'll be getting on, into on the night bus, that's quite a niche thing that that's covering. But I guess in the wizarding world you have stuff like flu powder though, and so, yeah. But it's interesting that, that, that Hermione's on holiday and there's no direct equ wizarding equivalent of sending a postcard to, uh, you know, to, to, to a muggle household. Um, so yeah, she was worried about s sending it um, in the way that, but with which she did. Um, but she, uh, but she, so she ordered something direct to to Harry, I believe, via owl order, which is obviously a a um, a parody of mail order, which a lot of you may not even know what it is, guys, because that's a quite a dated term now. But yes, uh, basically ordering something via via the mail, you basically write away for something, and then they send 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 you whatever it is. So owl order is out is what it's called, which is ridiculous. Um, and she's like mentioning how she's actually really jealous of Ron getting to learn about the Egyptian wizards. And I say learn in inverted commas, guys, because I'd imagine Ron didn't really care about a lot of that stuff. But uh, Amani actually does say that she's jealous about that. You would think that when it comes to wizarding worlds, Egypt would definitely be one of the more interesting places. Would be the most interesting. You'd imagine Britain would be up there. Egypt would be right up there with the most interesting. Greek as well. Yeah. Yeah, Egypt and Greece would, would be the most fascinating place to, to learn about, you know, ancient wizardry in those areas. So, yes, uh, Hermione's actually uh, doing her paper on French wizards, which, is, which makes a lot of sense. Um, like I say, it, it really is nice to hear about the different cultures at this point before Goblet of Fire. Because in Goblet of Fire, it's like, whoa, hang on, there's all these different cultures. I didn't even think about this. Whereas the fact that we're hearing about it this early is nice as well. That's not to take away from the moment in Goblet of Fire where they turn up at the World Cup. Because that is a glorious moment. I think you can tell by my facial expression when that scene started. It's like, oh my god, this is incredible. Uh, so, so that was brilliantly done in the movie, but in in the book, it's nice to hear about you know other cultures because someone's gone on holiday somewhere. Everything. Shame that they're talking about holiday, obviously, because I don't think Harry's. Have we ever heard about the Dursleys gone on holiday? What happened on Philosopher's Stone doesn't count, of course, because that was terrifying. Vernon going absolutely nuts. I'd imagine that they would. There's something about uh, Spanish holiday homes, isn't there, in, in uh, Chamber of Secrets? Would Harry be... No, no, no! Harry stays with uh, Blumen. Oh, man. The Squib. I can't remember a Blumen name. But her ancestor is in um, uh, Hogwarts Legacy, isn't she? Isn't he? Oh, I can't remember. Too many names, guys. There's too many names, but yeah, um, that's that's where she, well, that's where he has to stay when they go on holiday. So, ignore me. Ah, la, 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 la. So Ron is actually ha happy to to hear about uh, what what what's uh, uh, what's happened to Percy. Actually, uh, Hermione's delighted. Actually, she actually says that that she's actually really happy for Percy, which is so nice, guys. It's nice for people to actually be nice to Percy. I think that sometimes Ginny does is quite nice to Percy, but everyone else is constantly giving Percy bobbins, <laughs> and so um, yeah, it's it's nice that Hermione's actually genuinely delighted for Percy, even though Ron absolutely isn't. Um, but then again, that's Ron's self loathing though, isn't it? Partly. Partly. Because obviously Percy is laying on a bit thick, as we will get to. Uh, we, we, Harry gets like a, um, a broomstick service kit from Hermione. I get the impression it's meant to be pretty expensive because Harry's like kind of taken aback by it. And you would imagine at this point with Ron in his ear every night talking about Quidditch, he would know about broom, bro, broomstick ser, servicing kits, so I'd imagine it probably costs a pretty penny um, for for Hermione to, to get this to to, to uh, Harry. Um, I presume that's from Muggle money as well being transferred. I believe that, I think that we've talked about money getting transferred from um, 
from uh, Sterling to uh, Garland's in previous books. I think it was actually, I think it was in Chamber of Secrets, in fact. I'd imagine that's that, that that's the case. Um, yes, so Harry does get a third parcel, which is a parcel from, from Hagrid, which is the Monster Book of Monsters, which is interesting because when that was in um, A Prince of Azkaban, it was kind of like, it felt kind of out of nowhere, but uh, it's actually being gifted to Harry. Which is a, it's an okay gift. I guess it's a gift because Hagrid's very proud about what his position is now, and so he's like buying his his friend the book that's going to be involved in his in his lesson. But considering it's on Harry's shopping list as well, it's like ah, oh. <laughs> I'm sure that Harry didn't feel like that at all though. Um, and so yes, Harry uses a belt to like shut the keep the book shut and everything. Um, and yes, we hear about Hogsmeade and the permission letter. Now, I, I thought the first time we heard about this permission letter, letter in the movie uh, was when McGonagall was basically saying, it's out of my hands, Harry, you can't go. But my goodness, it is in there, guys. This is another thing which I was thinking, oh, that's different. But no, it is actually in the movie. It's just a very brief line where Harry likes it. I think it's Harry's first line to anyone. Yeah, it is. Um, to, to Vernon, like, saying, um, hey, I've got this thing, C can you sign it? It's just school stuff. Doesn't really explain what it is, which is probably smart of him, but there is, there is a big discussion in the next chapter regarding that letter, which I, I, oh, man, I didn't think, because it was so subtly done in the movie, I didn't even notice that line, but that is, it, it, the permission slip is mentioned right back there, and so, yeah, we, we'll get into it, and Harry's already not the feeling like he's going to be allowed to go in. I'll say this, guys. This permission letter is so interesting in these first four chapters. Because I really didn't give it a second's thought in the movie. But there are... The fact that everyone is not... is Like, everyone. Like, Fudge and Arthur and everything. Maybe not Arthur. Somebody else. I like say, oh no, no, you should, you should be allowed to go Hogsmeade. At least not this year. Who is it that says that? Someone says not this year. I find it. I feel like it is Fudge. We'll get into it in the third chapter, guys. But someone specifically says not going to Hogsmeade this year. Very telling, and I, I like that. It, it really, it's brilliant. It, it, the permission slip is really used as a really good tool to get Black over Sirius. I should say Sirius Black over. So we will get into that in chapter two, but great first chapter, guys. Obviously, covering 20 seconds of the movie, <laughs> but I thought it was great. I, it, it was so nice for this to be flushed out. Fleshed out. Oh, I, I don't think we're actually done yet. Do, 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 do. No, I, I've just got like a little, little note here, like saying that it's a really nice and happy way of starting the book. It really is. And in fact, the last line of this chapter, which is a perfect way of ending it, uh, Felt like it's the first time that Harry felt like everyone else. Glad for the first time in his life that it was his birthday. What a nice, lovely end to that chapter. Such a sweet line. He is already worried about the permission slip. Um, obviously, he has no. <laughs> he's he's, he's going to have more reason to worry about it very soon. But um, great first chapter. Nice happy start to the book. So let's move on to chapter two. Uh, Aunt Marge's big mistake. And as if by magic, it's highlighted. Thank you very much, Jonas. These are really cool. Okay, now to Max's um, summary. When Harry goes down for breakfast the next morning, he hears two bits of news. One that he, that, that well, one that he heard that Kate comes from the TV station about an escaped convict named Black who could be in the area. And the second one is that uh, Uncle Vernon's sister, Marge, is coming to visit, uh, which was not on the news. <laughs> she made life worse than usual for Harry wh when she visits. Harry and v Vernon then come to an agreement that if Harry plays along with the full story of where he goes uh, to school, Vernon will sign Harry's permission slip to, uh, to go to Hogsmeade. As... As expected, Marge, along with uh, her, her dog Ripper, there we go, immediately starts uh, starts on Harry. Throughout her stay at the Dursley, she tells Harry she would have dropped him off at an orphanage and not only insults him, but insults his mother and father while Harry just thinks about Hogwarts to get through, through, through it. 
and the um, the the uh, service kit that Hermione got him as well. Um, on her last night, she finally crosses the line when she compares his mother to a dog and essentially calls her a. This part is has been censored so Benji doesn't get flagged. Um, enrages Harry. I'm not sure if that was actually on the last night. I feel like that was actually on the first night. We'll get into. I, 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 we'll go into the notes. I, I think that, that that was. It was the thing about James that that really sent them over over the uh, over the edge. Um, not meaning to, he causes uh, Aunt Marge to inflate like a balloon. Then, in a fury, gathers his things and leaves the leaves the Durves to Lee's house. Thank you very much for for your um, summary, Max. As always, I do feel like that that the what's good for the B and all that sort of thing was I feel like that was earlier on in the week well either way let, let's get into my notes anyway um because it'll probably be because I, I I write them in order and so we'll we'll find out then so uh so yes on the news which is insane to me um uh, the, uh, Harry hears about uh, the Dursleys. He actually hears it on a new TV that apparently um, the Dursleys got for Dudley as a, co a coming home present. I'm guessing that's because um, where D Dudley goes to school is also a um, what do they call it? You know, a stay in school. Um, so yes, Dudley gets a coming home present. I'm, I presume that <laughs> Harry did not. But yes, there's a TV because Dudley was complaining about the distance between the, uh, the the sitting room, I think, and and the uh, and the kitchen, and the fact there isn't a TV in between them, and so he uh, has an extra TV. And yes, Harry hears about Sirius Black on Muggle Television, which just blew my mind, guys. It's just like that is something which I did not expect. Is it is like as insane as when Hagrid it says that Hagrid arrived on Sirius Black's motorcycle? It's just like wait, wait, wait what? So Muggle, this is what I'm talking about, the, the communication between the Wizarding World and Muggles and the Ministry ha having to have this connection with with the with broadcasting. You presume the person reading out the, 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 the article and everything on the news doesn't know anything about the Wizarding World. And so the higher ups there, and that's when legal stuff really comes in thick, guys. There has to be a legal thing where... Muggle New Television is legally obliged to not say anything about... Or maybe Muggle News is all run by wizards. That's the alternative. It's either the high-ups in, in television, in the news, specifically the news, let's specifically talk about the news, um, are all in on it, but have been signed to secrecy whilst doing their job, or the, Mug the Wizarding World own the media. Oh my, we're getting into con uh, conspiracy theories right here now. But that, maybe that's it, though. Oh, man. I hope not. Because that, that's bleaker. That's a lot bleaker if the Wizarding World run the press. Because we know how bad the Bloomin' Daily Prophet gets. But yeah, Muggle news, though. This whole legal thing is fascinating to me. Anyway, um... It doesn't say where he's escaped from, though, uh, which is uh, obviously not very useful for for anyone who's worried about him being around. Um, and Vernon is. He, he, Vernon's like saying that, that this, this lunatic could be just down the street and all that sort of thing, uh, which he, to be fair, is pretty perceptive of Vernon. <laughs> let's, let's put him over a little bit. Uh, Petuna is instantly looking out the window. I'll be honest, guys. I do that as well. It's like, have you seen this person? First thing I do is like look out the window, as if they're going to be just stood there. <laughs> but, it's, but it says that that um, Petuna is the, the 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 nosiest woman in the world, and is actually quite excited about the idea of being the one to 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 have black court and everything. Not worried about the fact that he's a. Uh, um, well, I don't know. I, I, the report is definitely suggesting that he's dangerous. It doesn't say what he did, because then Petunia wouldn't be looking out the window, you know, or, or what what he did in inverted commas, I should say, because um, then he, I'm sure Petunia wouldn't be too excited about the prospect of seeing him in their garden. <laughs> um, I say garden because I am thinking about the TV, the movie. Uh, set up so like obviously the TVs are near the back of the house on 
on the movie. No, they're not. And ignore me. This is why these uh, these videos are so long, guys. So I start talking about the layout of the house. Um, but in my head canon, she looked out into the back garden, which wouldn't make any sense. Anyway. Anyway. I do be do be do. Vernon wants to bring back Hank. Yes, that's right. Now, Vernon goes blooming old school here. And it's like saying that they should bring back hang hanging. Which, even in the 90s, guys, was a very old thing. The last execution um, in the UK via hanging. I believe it was. Uh, in it was in 1964. And as I remember, there was massive controversy around it as well. Uh, and so, that's... I mean, there are still people now who think that you should that we should bring back hanging guys, and also a lot of countries where where I'm sure a lot of you guys live still do have that sort of punishment. But yeah, in the UK, we we, we the last time we had that was 1964, which um, obviously a long time ago now. Um, yeah, so that was like a a very Vernon thing to say you should bring back hanging, and there are a lot of people over here who think you should we should bring back you know. I don't even want to say the word, guys, but you know what I mean. It's, uh, it's my opinion of that is not a good idea. Believe it or not, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, uh, so Harry uh, being forced uh, to, to call uh, Marge aunt, which I think is fine. Uh, it just makes things simpler, you know. It's it seem odd that Dudley's calling uh, Marge aunt, but uh, Harry isn't because obviously she isn't technically his aunt. Um, what would what would she be to Harry? It's a distant relative, isn't it? I don't think there's any particular name for it. But um, I feel like that's fair enough. The fact that Harry would call her aunt. I mean, it's it's not exactly. It mentioned it, and I thought, well. It's not really that bad a thing. You know, what, what she's actually like is actually horrendous. The fact that he has to call her aunt is not that that's horrendous. <laughs> but, um... Um... What? Dudley's fifth March... Oh, yes! So, so on Dudley's fifth birthday, I should say. Um, apparently, uh, Harry was going to be winning... Uh, to win musical chairs until Marge whacked him with uh, with her walking stick, I think. Which is just... Bruce, age five, guys. I don't know he would have been. Oh, are Dudley and Harry the same age? They are, aren't they? They're the same age. I, I swear they are. So that is just brutal. Um. Uh, when like Dudley got given like some sort of robotic thing for a birthday, Harry apparently got dog biscuits. I mean, it's a present. And it's okay, I, 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 I'm not going to start trying to defend Marge. Definitely not. That is her, she, she is an absolute monster. But yes, the fact that she even gave him some, anything actually surprised me. And Dog Biscuits, you'd imagine, is something which he has to hand quite quite a lot. Um, Harry once stepped on Ripper's tail, apparently, and got chased. And I think it, I think it said they had to go, go, go up a tree or something. Um... And like it, Dudley like remembers that as being like one of the funniest things that uh, in his life and everything. Um, and yes, Marge is actually coming for a week, guys. Um, which I'd imagine is probably the case in the movie again. Again, this is something which I didn't really think about it, but when she does come in, she has got like a big bag, hasn't she? Um, and so when I was watching the movie, I didn't really think about it, but I, I think this was actually meant to be staying for a while at least. But yes, no, in the movie, it's actually a week. And we have the whole sequence, guys. We, we, we have it until the last day that she's that she's staying there. Um, and Harry's having to keep Sturm and everything uh, just so he can go to Hogsmeade. Um, uh, yeah, so Harry is definitely really standing up for for herself, um, which he, which he does in the movie as well. But he keeps on using the term "I will" if she does to Vernon. He, she says it once, I think, in the movie. Uh, but um, but but like Vernon's like saying, "Be polite to, to her, uh, don't cause any trouble." And and Harry keeps on saying, "I will if she does." Just which no, he definitely seen the confidence coming out of Harry at this point uh, with, with the Dursleys. Um, so yes, we hear about Sir Brutus's, uh, Brutus, ridiculous, Brutus, Brutus, Brutus's, a uh, secure centre for incurably criminal boys, which Ver Vernon does say in the movie as well, it's not something which I remembered, but he does actually mention that, um, and yes, Harry, like, thinks about, um, 
uh, thinks about how uh, Marge coming is the worst birthday present that Dursley's ever got him. Which I'm sure wasn't on purpose. I, I, I get the impression that they don't even remember where Harry's birthday is, quite frankly. Uh, but yes, he, he sees it as a, a, a bad Christmas present, which is amazing. Um, he has re he has previously got some socks from Vernon. Old used socks from Vernon. Um, and so maybe that, so they would have to remember when his birthday is then. But no, there's no Marge connection. Marge, I imagine, was just coming over anyway. I don't think it's anything to do with Harry, actually, um, Harry's birthday. Um, this is the bit which fascinates me here, guys. Harry straight up blackmails Vernon. <laughs> Good for him. Good for him. But yes, it is blackmail, though, guys. Um, so yeah, um, he, he, he basically does the, what, what do they call it? It's what gangsters do. So is that your, your car in the, in, the, in the car park? Be terrible if something happened to it. You know that sort of thing? Um, uh, what's it called? Protection money, I think it's called, isn't it? It's like, yeah, so uh, it's a nice sister you got there. Be terrible if anything happened to it. It's basically what Harry's saying here. Um, and yeah, we had this wonderful dialogue between Harry and Vernon, guys. I thoroughly enjoy this. It is in the movie, but Vernon isn't really paying attention to what Harry's saying. He's just like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but here we have Vernon basically, or if Vernon straight up threatens to hit Harry. Uh, if, if, if anything, if, if, if Harry basically says, what would happen if uh, if I wasn't to tell uh, Marge that I go to Sir Bruins's? And Vernon like says, well, you, you'll get clobbered or something like that. I can't remember the exact term that he says. And so we have one person blackmailing one, one threatening violence. It's a typical day in the Dursley's house here. Oh, oh dear, guys. Um, yes, then you have Harry being diplomatic. And this is the this is the stuff which I really enjoy between Vernon and Harry at this point, is that the diplomacy between two people who hate each other. Harry, like, like, like... He, he goes to say muggle in a sentence. I'm not sure what that sentence is, but it's basically saying, uh, you know, if you want me to act, act like... A and then stops himself and says normal. Because Vernon would absolutely know what muggle means. I don't know if, if maybe Vernon goes blows off the handle whenever he hears, hears the term. I, I have no reason to believe that's the case. So what I think that Harry is doing here is actually sugarcoating... Sugarcoating? sugarcoating his ultimatum that he is giving Vernon. And then Vernon straight up gives Harry an ultimatum. And so this dialogue I thought was fantastic, actually. I really liked this. Uh, and Vernon basically says um, that, that I will sign the thing if you stick to the story for a week. Pretty brutal to say that he's going to super St. Brutus's. Uh, so yeah, I really like that. I really like this little discussion between Harry and Vernon. Um, yeah, I thought it was great that, and also the fact that the letter is being brought into it so early. Because I, I didn't notice the line in the movie, guys. Because because Harry doesn't even say what it is. He basically, says, I got this. Can you sign it? It's just a thing. It doesn't actually say that it is the Hogsmeade letter that that he needs them to sign. Um, and so that was a line which I instantly forgot. A second after it, after it's said, but th that letter has such significance in these first few chapters. It really does, and I mean it's brilliantly done. And so, I completely understand why it was cut from the movie. But it's it's a very useful tool to like say, even Hogwarts Harry can't feel normal because of this letter holding him back. I think it's really cool. I, I thought it was a really nice, um, not addition because this is the original, but you know what I mean. I thought it worked very, very well. Um, so Dudley actually doesn't like Marge's hugs. It's interesting actually because it, it kind of puts over the fact that um, Dudley and Petunia don't like, don't particularly like Marge visiting. But Vernon, I presume Vernon does. But no one else really does. So, so Dudley doesn't like the fact that that uh, that she's she's hugging him and everything. But it puts up with it because he knows he's going to get money. <laughs> Amazing. Um, 
And yeah, it says how like Petuna is like wincing with the, like watching like Ripper like you know lapping up some some water or something, and it's just like making like stains on her carpet and everything. So it's really cool. And it is there. The, the, yeah, the actress who played Petuna was fantastic, guys. I've said that before. I, 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 Vernon, I know him as being a fantastic actor from numerous other things. Petuna, I don't think I've seen on anything else, but she was brilliant in the role. She was absolutely brilliant. And the subtlety of her face when when she's given Ripper's lead. As Marge turns back to Vernon, it's like <laughs> trying to be polite, just trying her best to be polite, uh, but being mortified with what she's having to do. She's brilliant. I thought she was absolutely great. And because books can do that, um, it gets explained a lot more. But quite frankly, what they did in the movie is rewarding. Because having watched, having read the, the, that part of the book, I then go back to the movie and I can then see that it is actually happening right there. So. Good on the actress and good on the director for, for including that in, in the movie. Uh, we hear about uh, Colonel Fubster. I've got here, I'm not sure if that's the correct pronunciation, but Colonel Fubster, who's like a retired uh, colonel, obviously, um, and looks after Marge's dogs. Um, Harry doesn't seem to be being as sarcastic. In the movie, Harry is straight up being sarcastic to the point where it's obvious to anyone that isn't a Dursley that he's basically taking the Mickey out of them. And so um, he's like, "Oh yeah, yeah, I get, I get Kane all the time." Yeah, you know, it's like proper. I don't know if you've seen Barbara Ted, guys, but there is a um, uh, a character on it who's meant to be the most sarcastic priest in the world, and everything he says is like, "Oh no, yeah." Like that. Harry in the movie is like properly layering on thick the fact that he's actually mocking Marge in his, in his replies. I think she does pick up on it actually. Well, she says what you're smirking at and stuff like that, but yeah. But Harry has the ultimatum. I know it's there in the movie as well, guys. It's but but it's basically say yeah, I'll, I'll I'll sign whatever it is if you behave. But to have this specific contract between Harry and Vernon, Harry certainly is not he's not pushing. You know, he's not he's not pushing it too far because he knows that it will have bad ramifications for Hogwarts, which is this happy place. And so, very interesting dynamic. But in the movie, he's definitely really laying it on thick with his sarcasm. Um, Marge actually does like Harry being around because she gets to criticize him all the time. You know, and the fact that she's clearly goading him as well. He she, she's waiting for him to. To snap, basically. Um, in fact, yes, she actually she she will give Dudley a gift, and then immediately look to Harry, waiting for him to say, "Why? Well, hey, why didn't I get anything?" She wants him to, to to go over the edge, and so it's a horrible situation of Vernon saying, "Okay, you behave," and then she, Harry having to behave to this person who is clearly enjoying the fact that she's trying to get him to lose his cool. Horrible character. Horrible, horrible character. Um, Marge, not Harry. <laughs> yes! Um, yes, here we go. Uh, so, I've in my notes, I think my notes are right. Uh, on the third day that Petunia is there, they're having lunch, uh, and uh, and we get the line, uh, what's good for the bee. Uh, oh, no, 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 no. That's Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, what's good for the bee is uh, good for the pup, whatever. Uh, and that's when the glass is broken, and Harry just basically gets out of dodge, and like, 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 just goes off to his room just to, like, you know, diffuse the situation. Obviously, in the movie, that is actually the start of what will actually turn into the major argument that you know causes what happens to happen. But this that actually happens on the third night. On the last night, on the e on the last evening before uh, Marge is meant to be leaving. Um, Harry's just constantly thinking about Hogwarts and his friends and uh, mem re mem remembering uh, memorized things that he's got out of the broomstick servicing handbook um, whenever Marge is like criticizing him, which is basically all the time. Um, we hear about Vernon's company being called uh, Grunnings. Um, I don't think think that has been mentioned before has it it may have been mentioned in philosopher's stone it may have been mentioned in philosopher's stone but uh when i looked up grumming runnings i think there's a picture 
possibly in the background on the movies of Vernon standing outside a factory with Grunnings uh, written on it. And so, yeah. I, 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 if it was mentioned in, in the first book, I apologise. But I think this is the first time we, that we hear about uh, what his, his company is actually called. Uh, um, so Marge is getting absolutely tanked up on wine, on wine and brandy, which is not a good mix. Um, we get the line which is in the movie uh, saying that she usually just has a fry up. Um, I don't know if that's spe a specifically a British term, guys. I don't know what you'd call it elsewhere but I'd, i've never heard the term fry up in anything made from outside the uk do you know what a fry up is i think you could probably imagine it's just basically stuff which you just chuck in a frying pan and just fry up generally sausages bacon tomato hash browns uh not necessarily a uh, all all day uh english breakfast which is an amazing thing to behold, guys. It really is. There's lots of lots of debate about what should actually be in an English breakfast, guys. From what I... Okay, if you were to ask me... And obviously, I'm vegan. So, I, I can't have this. I can have, like, vegan versions of it. Uh, quite a few places do do vegan versions of it. No egg, though, unfortunately. Eggs... Egg is something that is still... Once someone creates a, a good fried egg, will be the happiest day of my life. <laughs> But what I see is being necessary, and if you disagree with me, if you're English or if you're not, but you've had an English breakfast before, or British I should say, um, let me know what you think should be an English breakfast. And this is why my videos are also always so long, because it always uh, go so long. Now let's get the obvious ones out of the way. Sausages. No one's going to have an English bre breakfast without sausages. I think that bacon is also an absolute, you had to have, so sausages, bacon, fried eggs, Absolutely. I guess that some people would argue that scrambled eggs should be, would would be okay for a, a fried bre uh, a English breakfast. If you're asking me what an English breakfast is, it has to be fried eggs. Um, I would then. This is where it starts to get a little bit, little bit controversial. I'm going to say hash browns. I mean, some people say other types of potato, but hash browns is, is what I'm going to go for. For me, definitely mushrooms all day. Um, fried tomato is a must. And I think that's where it... No, no, no. I would then also argue that baked beans as well. Baked beans are something which are incredibly popular in the UK, guys. From what I gather, like I think 94% of the world's baked beans are consumed in the UK. <laughs> amazing um that though, though those, those are the necessities um oh and, and i would actually you know, this, this is going to be the controversial one i would also add orange juice to that as well with whatever other beverage you're having but that's what i associate as being an english breakfast because i don't drink tea uh but um that, that that's what i see as being an english breakfast so that isn't necessarily what um marge is talking about because a fry up could just be like chips and sausages. I think it had to be in a fry up. Yeah, but yeah, that, that's basically what a fry up means. Just like very, very greasy, chucked in a frying pan, loads of oil all over it. Very basic cooking, basically. Um, so yes, hence, you know, hence Mar Marge's figure. Because obviously she is not someone who's uh, eating particularly healthily. But like I say, that line is in is in the movie. I've got so sidetracked now. I apologize. <laughs> but then again, you guys say that you like the longer videos. And so I'm, I do try to stay a little bit focused, though. Because in the past, I have gone on way too many tangents. Um, the handbook criticizes him for the company. Uh, yeah, I usually has a fry up. Right, so Marge and... Oh, God, I don't even want to say this, guys. Oh, man. Uh, Marge had a uh, fubster once drown a, a runt in her pack, which is freaking horrendous. But, you know, that's what freaking happens to these bloody idiots. We have animal charities, guys. You can just go and take, you know, your, your animal to those charities and they will look after it and then pass it on. That's how I got Woozle, guys. Woozle was tied to a fence at night during a thunderstorm and just left there. Uh, and she was a nervous dog 
obviously, but she was absolutely horrified in that situation. Um, and then, like, you know, the local vet luckily was uh, found her and uh, took her in and then took off to the char char charity to be rehomed, and that's what I, what I gave her. But yes, unfortunately, I don't want to dwell on that line too much. It's a horrible line, and it, yeah, it upsets me. Uh, so, yes, anyway. Um... So Harry is really thinking about all these things in, in the handbook. Is the charm to cure reluctant reverses uh, is a is a is a chapter in in the handbook. Um, presumably, that's for brooms that don't easily fly backwards. Because brooms can fly backwards, can't they? I'm pretty sure. But uh, a charm to cure reluctant reverses, which would probably suggest that all brooms can reverse, but some aren't that great at it. And so that's presumably what that charm is for. Um, very interesting that Marge brings up blood. Um, obviously, in, you know, talking about Harry's parents and everything, but obviously we then do have the whole half-blood comparison going on at Hogwarts with, with, um, with numerous characters and so on, which was a big... Uh, big chunk of last book's storyline. And now we're hearing about Harry's blood not being right. It's very interesting. Um, very interesting that Marge, I believe, actually knew Lily. She, she I, I think it does imply that Marge had met Lily. Uh, she does ask about what James did uh, uh, for, for a job, but... Um, I, from what I gather, Marge did actually at some time, God knows when, because you'd imagine that Vernon and Petrina didn't want anything to do with Lily and James. But I do get the impression that Marge did actually meet uh, Lily at some point. Hence her then being able to say the line about, you know, the B and the, uh, the, B and the P. Not the B. Yes, you're the B. <laughs> anyway, um, Vernon tells uh, Marge... James doesn't work. Yeah, so in the movie, it's Petunia. And the way that Petunia says it in the movie, you do get the impression... I think she's great, guys. The actress who plays Petunia. The way that she says that line, it, it does sound like she's kind of ashamed that she's saying it. Go back and watch, watch that scene, guys. It does kind of like say, no, no, she, 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 he, he, he didn't work. Maybe I'm thinking too much into, into it, but I, I, I really like that. Sorry, guys. I'm kind of... I've thrown myself off for that thing about the uh, the runt just now, guys. It does upset me. Oh, um, I'm I'm I, I I'm a big animal lover, guys. Animals have got me through lots of the worst times of my life, and so just hearing lines like that upset me. I'm sorry. I will try and re re refocus here. Um. Yeah. So so it is very similar to, to, to all this information that that all this stuff that Marge is saying is very very similar to how it was in the mo in the movie and when harry starts to lose it vernon Im immediately uh tells harry to go to bed which is in the movie but it's after the glass break which is slightly different and like marge instantly says oh no 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 because she wants him to step over the step over the line um it's freaking sadist it really is horrible um Marge bringing up the car crash and everything obviously she she knows all this uh, from memory um and that's, it's the car crash that, that, yeah. In my notes, I, I could be wrong here, guys, but but the, it's the car crash that is the thing which Harry snaps at and says that that isn't how they died. Um, so I believe that that's the moment where it all just escalates and starts to fall apart. Quite frankly, the inflating scene in the movie is done perfectly. It's slightly different, but it's so good. It's so good. It doesn't have the bit where, where in the book, it doesn't have um, Dudley getting hit in the face by the, by the uh, buttons or anything like that. Um, I think that he's just still watching TV, quite frankly. it's You know what? It's very short. In, in, in the book, it's extremely short. And usually, it's the other way around. It's usually uh, the movie really shrinks down little moments, like the conversation between Vernon and Harry regarding the letter, uh, which is like... Five seconds tops in the movie. Um, but the scene in the book is basically she starts to inflate, describes it beautifully, and then Harry leaves as it's still happening. And so she's basically on the roof. There's no moment where where she like flies out the window or anything like that. Uh, but that is that did make for a, a great 
payoff. Yeah, because in, in in the you know what hmm. in, in in the movie. Obviously, you have the whole thing where she goes flying out the window. You have like, Vernon hold on to it. And I say, sorry, it just lets go of her. Um, but why would that be... Why did they make that change? Because quite frankly, in, this, in the book, if it was left how it was at the book, Harry just leaves as Petunia is basically just... Not Petunia, sorry. Marge has uh, hit, hit the roof. Uh, so there's no mention of there even being an open door or anything. Um... Uh, and so, I, I I wonder if maybe they would have thought that would have been not a too scary payoff. The fact that she's just left like that. Whereas her floating off is slightly funnier. But then again, I'd also ask you that, uh, argue that that's potentially worse. I don't know. I don't know. Either way, the movie did it beautifully. It, quite frankly. I don't. I can't imagine anyone's got any criticisms about what how they did it in the movie, guys. I thought it was done brilliantly. I really did. And a big payoff to a horrible freaking week. A long, a whole week that, that book Harry's had to put up with this. Um, Vernon's actually blooming, uh, bleeding like profusely as well. Apparently from R Ripper who's, who grabbed onto him as soon as she, he, he went to grab Marge. So obviously Ripper is very defend, you know, defending his, his mother and everything. Uh, but yeah, apparently Vern is actually in a bit of a state <laughs> at this point. Um, Harry tells her to change her bag. Yeah, no, it's very interesting that the book, book uh, uh, Vernon does seem actually upset about what's happened. Because like I say, he does seem to be the only one who cares. So he's like saying, turn her back, turn her back. Um, and Harry's saying that, that she deserved it and everything. Um, Vernon does not bring up the fact that he used magic and he won't be able to go back to Hogwarts. And I prefer the book version here because Vernon is upset. I hate the fact that I'm... Basically, this whole first two chapters, guys, I mean, me taking the side of Marge and Vernon. It's just, I like to see that I was perspective. Book Vernon is a lot more distraught at this point and worried and scared for his, for his sister. Whereas in the movie, he's like, oh, you, you got nowhere to go. Like that. It's like, yeah. Interesting. It's interesting, but you know what? That information was useful in the movie because it's a good refresher to remember that, that he can't do that. Whereas in the book, Harry's thinking to himself, oh balls, oh balls, oh balls, I've just screwed it all up. I'm going to get kicked out of Hogwarts. I might be getting taken to Azkaban, he's actually thinking. Whereas in the movie, you don't have that internal dialogue, and so instead, Vernon says it instead. And so that's fine. It's, it's, a, it's a fine change. Either way, excellent chapter. Upsetting to get through. It is upsetting. But it's meant to be upsetting. Of course it's meant to be upsetting. It did its job perfectly, quite frankly. Um, oh, man. Yeah, it really did. In, in the movie, Harry like goes upstairs and like kicks like a, a, a desk in frustration. And then he's bringing his trunk downstairs when Vernon uh, like you know, confronts Harry. But in, in, in the book all his trunk and everything is underneath the stairs, which I presume the Dursleys think that he can't get to, but he just goes, grabs it, and is straight out the door. Um, he does take Hedwig's cage, which means he must have gone upstairs then. It it, it does mention that, he is, that he's taking Hedwig's, Hedwig's cage with him, um, whereas in the movie, Hedwig is just up, left upstairs, right in the cage. I'm going to have to refresh myself. Uh, that's what I do as I do this. I refresh myself with, with, with the scenes that, that we're covering. But all in all, fantastic chapter, guys. Upsetting, honestly upsetting to get through. Because it is a lot of... Ho it's a horrible character. The fact that she is so much... She is. She is much worse than Vernon. I don't think there's any discussion to be had there, guys. I feel like she is just much worse than Vernon. Vernon hates Harry... For what he is. No, he is trying to mentally torture him as well. But not as much as Marge. Marge's main thing with Harry is that she, she enjoys him being there so she can bully him. Whereas Vernon dreams of the day where he never has to think about Harry again. 
Neither are pleasant characters in the slightest, guys, but Marge is definitely a worse character. I wonder if we'll ever hear of her again. I'd imagine we probably will in the books. But we're done for her now. Good riddance, quite frankly. Let's get on to chapter three, The Night Bus. I just remembered uh, two other things for uh, English breakfast. Toast, definitely. If it's a fry up instead of an English breakfast, then you'd have a fried bread, which is incredibly bad for you. <laughs> and, um, and black pudding as well, which uh, I know to a lot of people outside the UK seems a bit weird. But yes, I mean, uh, when I ate meat, I liked it, but that was a long time ago now. And so I can't have any of it, but I just thought I'd mention that. Right, enough waffle. This Okay, let's go on with it. Chapter three, note bus. Max's uh, summary. After realising he just ran away from home and performed illegal magic, Harry starts to panic and thinks he's going to be expelled from Hogwarts and begins to think of life as an outcast on the run. He then looks up to a terrifying big black dog. Harry falls backwards, causing his wand hand to come out and immediately a, a giant purple bus appears out of nowhere. Max, thank you very much for putting it like that because I actually didn't realise that, that that action was actually significant. We'll, we'll discuss it. Uh, a man named Stan Shan Sh Shunpike <laughs> um, introduces himself and welcomes Harry aboard the night bus. I'd introduce uh, also introducing Ernie, the bus driver. Someone else noticeable by his absence here. Harry acts like he he's meant he, he meant to oh he, Harry acts like he meant to summon it and tells him that his name is Neville Longbottom and he would uh, would like to go to Diag Diagon Alley. During transport, they start to talk about Sirius Back, who was mentioned on the Muggle News, and how he was a supporter of You Know Who kill and killed 13 people, 12 of them Muggles, after Voldemort's defeat, and the and his first person, uh, he's the first person to escape Azkaban. Finally arriving in Diagon Alley, Harry is greeted right away by Cornelius uh, Fudge, the Minister of Magic. Harry freaks out, but Fudge assures him that he that they wanted to make sure he was safe, and there will be no punishment for what he did to the Dursleys at the Dursleys. Harry is suspicious. Why Fudge tells him tells that oh so suspicious, but Fudge tells him uh, tells that he can stay at the Leaky Cauldron and Diagon, Diagon Alley for the rest of the summer. Hedwig then shows up uh, as Fudge leaves and. Uh, very exhausted Harry goes to bed. Very interesting change. I mean, okay. Lots of changes. Lots of changes in the movie version here, guys. I ain't mad at the vast majority of them, quite frankly. Um, we'll discuss it. We'll discuss it. Um, just need to stop recording then because I was just finalising my order for my marquee to go onto my uh, homemade arcade cabinet, which I've been working on. So if, if you uh, haven't been following my social media, then uh, I'll post a video about that soon. Anyway, enough waffle. So uh, so me and uh, Max basically worded it pretty much exactly the same way. Harry is panicking about what he is done. And um, of, oh, he's actually panicking about where he is because he's completely like... Uh, I'm sure he kind of knows where he is, but he's completely alone. He has nowhere actually to go at all. And obviously about what he's just been doing with the magic as well. Um, he does think to himself, um, he's trying to work out ways of, of getting out of the situation where he's at. And so he's actually thinking about putting his father's um, invisibility cloak over him as he flies over to, uh, to Diagon Alley, which would be an option. Probably quite dangerous. You can imagine pretty pretty dangerous for like 13 year old um but he does think to himself if if um if he's already uh, expelled a little bit more, more magic can't hurt which is amazing so at this point harry absolutely thinks that that he's gonna get getting expelled and the subtleties of the movie um oh i didn't change the blooming artwork let's see if i can do this mid recording if uh, BBB isn't going to crash. Look at that! So pleased with that. That's so cool. Um, the subtleties of, of, you know, the way that Fudge was acting in the movie and everything didn't really... I didn't I didn't pick up on the fact that everyone is being very, very lenient to Harry. It, I, I actually really didn't. Even when Harry, like, um, 
questioned it in the movie. I didn't really think about it. I thought that Fudge was just kind of being a bit incompetent, really. But at this point, Harry absolutely thinks that that's it for him now. And like he's thinking about his future and everything. It's um, definitely a lot more... In the movie, he's, he's he seems really upset. Whereas in the book, he's actually properly like, oh God, what the hell, what the hell have I done? Where am I going to go? What's going to happen to me? Um... Yes, I said about the cloak on the broomstick. Is there any reason why that wouldn't have worked in Deathly Hallows Part 1? In the movie, because I don't know if it's exactly the same in, in, in the book. Where there's like loads of different Harry Potters. That being said, we know that... Well, actually, we say I, I don't know for a fact, but the theory is that Dumbledore know, c can see through it. And so I guess that means that potentially Voldemort can see through it as well. That being said, if Voldemort can see through the cloak, surely he would be able to see through the disguises of the Polyjuice. Well, maybe not. I'm not sure. But when he was thinking about flying over to London with the cloak on, I did instantly think of that scene in Deathly Hallows Part 1. Which may not even be in the, mo in, in the book, guys. <coughs> we'll get there. Uh, he suddenly senses that he's being watched and so this whole sequence is very different for one It's not like in a creepy park with like the creepy swings or anything like that um, uh, In the in the book It's just a street with like a row of houses in it and he sees a thing between a, a, a fence and a garage um, And so that's obviously di different from the movie where he comes out of the bushes Um but like I say, so yeah, he senses he's, he's getting he's getting watched. There's no flickering going on. The flickering f did throw me off, guys, because at the start, uh, with in the Marge scene, I should say, in the movie, uh, the, the lights start to flicker just before Harry uh, smashes her glass, um, and then you have the flickering here in the park when when. The, the big black dog, got to keep kayfabe, uh, comes out of the bushes. And so what is actually causing that? Does that mean that Sirius was at the house where... We're just talking about movie right now, but does that mean that Sirius was near the house when, um, when what happened happened? Maybe he made the glass smash? I don't think that's the case. Um, or does it mean... Because if it wasn't Sirius doing it, then why are the lights flickering when Sirius comes out of the bushes? Because no magic per se is being done at that point. Because I'd imagine that Sirius's dog form won't do that to lighting generally. But again, that, that this is movie uh, talk that we're talking about, not the book. It's it just a little bit of a... Interesting thought because I assumed that it was the same reason why the flickering was going on and then we have flickering with the Dementors later on don't we? All the blue and flickering in the movie guys anyway um, So as um, As Max pointed out and I didn't pick this up at all guys when Harry gets his wand out and falls back at the side of the road presumably him putting his hand with his wand in, uh, with, with the wand from the pavement to the road meant that he was signalling for the bus. Like, basically, uh, putting your thumbs up. Oh, you know, with a bus, you put your arm up, your hand up, don't you? Um, so, yeah, I didn't pick up on that at all until Max just mentioned that then. So, nice work, Max. Um, so, yeah, uh, there's that. It, it describes the uh, the night bus as a, a violently purple bus, which is amazing. Um, stands here. I did... I did make a reference to on the buses in my movie reaction. I doubt it's a, rea a reference, guys, but I think the times would link up with how old the author is. There was a sitcom, a British sitcom in the UK, guys. It started in 1969 and I think ended in 75. Very popular. Um, it's not my favourite sitcom of all time, I must admit. Um... Uh, but it's caught on the buses. And I think I mentioned this in my movie reaction as well. That the main character in On the Buses is called Stan. And f this is the only bus scene, <laughs> I think, apart from they need to get hit by a bus in Triangle Square on Deathly Hollows. Um, the only bus scene in Harry Potter 
and the character that we meet on it is called Stan. That's a big coincidence, right? Um, if it's called Stan Butler, then that would obviously be a direct reference. But also, I should also say that Stan on on the bus is actually the driver, not the not the ticket uh, collector. And so, yeah, but I, I still feel like the the author is of the age that that could be a reference on the buses. It was very popular, guys. It's certainly not my favorite comedy of all time, but um, it was very popular. And I, I I've watched quite a bit of it, and it was very very uh, famous in its time. That's why I do think that Stan's name might be Stan, but I don't know, guys. I don't know. Maybe the author's mentioned it in an interview or something. I'll have to look that up. Anyway, enough about Stan. <laughs> so, um, in the, in the movies, uh, Harry, when Stan, like, says, what are you looking at? Like that. Uh, Harry actually, well, in the book, he says that there's something over there. Whereas in, 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 uh, in the movie, he's, just he says nothing. Harry seems to be very um I want to say secretive, but in a way he's more secretive in the book. He's not giving much information to to Stan. Whereas in the book he is actually purposely pushing pulling his hair down so it covers his uh covers his scar. And he calls himself Neville Longbottom, which is Amazing. It's the first person who comes to mind is Neville Longbottom. I'd imagine he probably did think of Ron Weasley, but he's more concerned about getting Ron into Trump trouble than Neville. Yeah, he's a bit of a... He should have said Draco Malfoy. Oh, he, he should have said Draco. I uh, know, you know, I can't say Malfoy because that's too famous a, a name. No, Longbottom's a famous name. You should have said. Dean Thomas. <laughs> Get Dean into big trouble. That'd be amazing. Uh, yes. So the way that Neville, that, that Neville, the way that Harry is talking to Stan uh, is definitely very different in the book compared to the movie. Because in the movie he's being, he's almost being rude. I don't want, uh, in a way Stan's being rude. Because Stan like says, what did you say your name was again? Instead of saying, what's your name? Or asking more politely, he says, what What did you say your name was? And, and Harry is like saying, I, I, did, I didn't say what my name was. Whereas in the book he says his name is Neville Longbottom, which is amazing. <coughs> and he's worried because he's worried about the what the ministry uh, will think. Again, getting Neville into potential trouble, which is outrageous. Uh, we get a blooming price list. We get a price list, guys. This is awesome. So it's 10 quid to London. Uh, I guess it'd be ga Galleons, wouldn't it? But um, it's a tenner to London. 13 for hot chocolate. And to London, presumably, and 15 for a hot water bottle and toothbrush. When are you going to need a toothbrush on on the um, night bus? Because it's so fast. Surely, no, there are beds, aren't there? Because you're in Wales, I guess maybe it goes. No, it doesn't go all the way all the way to the world. Because Stan specifically says that that it can go anywhere land based, but it can't go through water. So why would you need to stay that long on the night bus? Unless there's like a really cheap version where they just drop you off whenever they're ready to. Because they get right on top of... Oh no, that... no they don't. Hush my words. I was going to say they get straight to Harry's order. They don't, guys. In the movie they do. They go straight to Diana... Diagon Alley from Pivot Drive. Or just off Pivot Drive. Uh, or was it Privet Drive? Privet Drive. Um, so that is different. In the book... They're going courageous. They're going through Wales, in fact. They go to Abergavenny, where uh, Madame Marsh is staying. Um, and uh, basically, Harry is the last stop for them. And so, the toothbrush, the toothbrush does make sense. Hot chocolate, the, with the way the bus stops. I should say, the bus stops and everything like shifts like a, a, a foot in the book. Whereas in the movie, Harry is like flung into the glass twice. You won't want to be holding some hot chocolate at that point. That being said, that's an awesome movie choice. I got to say, guys, all the cha changes that they made for the movie, apart from the ne Neville Longbottom thing, because that's hilarious. All the changes that they made, all of them? <sighs> I think the movie scene is fantastic. I really do. And it is very different. The bus is not, you know, the people on the bus are not going flying around uh, in in the um, in the book. Um, 
but that being said, it's such a joyous, oh my god, information, 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 ah, I won't be walking out to the road. And then Lenny Henry does the wrong countdown. Oh man, you guys pointed this out. I think he goes like, when the woman's like crossing the road and they're waiting for her to get out of the way. And Lenny Henry, or the shrunken head, who is a movie exclusive, I didn't see that coming, guys. Uh, like goes, five, four, three, three and a half, Two and a half. Uh, it, he basically gets it wrong because it would be five, four, three and a half, three. Who cares? <laughs> Such a stupid detail, but it is a bit of a mistake. Um, I'm amazed that the shrunken heads are not in it. I'm absolutely amazed that the shrunken heads not in it, guys. But uh, what a great addition for the movie scene. And it's always great to have Lenny Henry's laugh in it. Uh, Lenny Henry's laugh. Lenny Henry is a British comedian, like I said in my Prison of Azkaban. Uh, reaction guys um and and he's got an extremely familiar laugh and so just having his laugh in that scene is actually this is all in my age is actually a very nice thing is because it's kind of like um it's nostalgic in, in, in a weird way um but yeah not in the book um so, so uh, Stan seems to actually be enjoying uh, Harry's amazement with what's going on. And genuinely seems like a really nice guy in the book. He actually does. He's only like a couple of years older than Harry. Or a handful of uh, years older. Uh, but he's like really... He's definitely been very pleasant. Whereas the movie version... The movie version seems to be trying to scare him when talking about Sirius Black and everything like, like that. Um... I am jumping all over the place here, guys. But Ernie, um, the changes that they made for Ernie in the movie are great. The fact that he's, um, well, actually, in the book it says that he's in an armchair, and I think that I think that that is in the movie. I could be wrong, but there's no like massive blooming lever next to him, which is such an awesome look uh, visual. Obviously, no, uh, no shrunken head talking with him. Uh, one thing I really like is. I think he does it, I feel like he does it a couple of times, or it's just when the woman's crossing the road. I think it is just when the woman's crossing the road, and he's, like, eating, like, this, this sandwich. I think it's just bread, in fact, but he's just, like, like eating it, and they just, just uh, straight away. Ernie, the, they, Ernie's awesome in the movie. I freaking love Ernie in the movie, guys. But in the, in the book, he actually talks as well. Not as much as Stan, but Ernie is asking questions and everything, so that's very, very interesting. And like I say, Stan definitely seems like a nicer guy in the book version. Not that I got a problem with the movie version at all. This, these are two scenes which I think I love equally in the book and the movie, and yet they're both very different. Is that that could be the first time that's happened? I couldn't tell you which one I prefer, guys, because the chaos of the movie version version is hilarious. Um, but the 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 mis They're both brilliant. They're both brilliant. I'm not. I'm not even going to judge one being better than the better, better than the other. It's just different, but st the same quality. Um, so the buzz actually teleports in the book. So it's like popping over to Abergavenny. I think it goes through a couple of places in Wales, in fact. Um, and then it do does go back to just driving down uh, streets as well. Um, it's actually like mounting the pavement and everything, which I don't. I don't think it mounts the pavement in the movie. It's obviously going crazy, but I don't think it actually mounts the pavement. And we have things like, um, um, I've got it on, on here somewhere, phone boxes, like, jumping out of the way. And at one point, a whole, sh uh, a whole like, a, a farmhouse, like, goes whoop out of the way of the bus, and it pops back again, which is incredible. Uh, <coughs> in the book, that is. I thought I had a note here somewhere, but I'm going to mention it right now. That's uh, very interesting, because I was listening to the Jim Dale version at this point. Um, and he said um, that phone booths were having to jump out of the way, which I was thinking, that doesn't sound like a very English term. So I then popped over to the Steam and Fry version, and as I expected, Steam and Fry does refer to them as phone boxes. And so that's a strange one to me, because I'd imagine that people not from the UK wouldn't be completely baffled by the term phone box. <laughs> so <coughs> I think they could have kept it kept it as a phone box in the Amer in the uh, yeah in the Amer in American version, but it's no biggie. But when I did hear phone booth, I thought, hang on, I bet you anything that's a change, and it bloomin' was, it bloomin' was. Uh, so yeah, Ernie actually speaks. I don't think he says a single word word in in, in the uh, movie. 
He's in it for such a short amount of time. I don't think he does. I freaking love Ernie movie, movie Ernie though. Um, so yeah, Stan wakes up Madame Marsh and Ab Abergavenny. So because the book version is a little bit, little bit calmer, <laughs> um, uh, Harry is still constantly worrying about the ministry and what's going to happen to him and everything. So it really holds that seed going. Whereas in the movie, he's just like, okay, fight or flight. I need to worry about what's going on right now. Um, but yeah, even when talking with Stan, he's still thinking about what his, what his future is going to hold. Uh, and yeah, they get onto a serious back. Um, the most the most infamous prisoner to be held at, at at Azkaban is how Stan refers to him. No, no, I think it's the newspaper. I I think I feel like the, the, the Daily Prophet that says that. Really? Uh, that makes me question how old Azkaban is, because I wouldn't think that old. The most infamous prisoner to be held at Azkaban. So that's the dude from um Deathly Hollows out then. The guy who Voldemort gets the, the wand off. That guy is obviously not as bad as uh or as infamous. It's very specific infamous. That guy's obviously not as bad as what Sirius Black is considered to, to be. Sirius Black, the most infamous prisoner to be held at Azkaban. What mean what about Bellatrix? I that did surprise me guys that Sirius would be would be the, the most infamous ever to be held at, at Azkaban. Let me know your thoughts on that. Uh Sirius believe Sirius is believed to actually have a gun, in fact, and uh, the Blade David Prophet refers to it as uh, as a tool that is used to by by muggles to kill each other. It's a brutal way of describing it. Uh, yes, Black has killed um, killed 13 people with a single curse. In front of witnesses as well. Um, Sirius, his face is described as very shrunken. And like very vampiric. In fact, Harry like says that he's he's never seen a vampire. But from what he's learnt in uh, Defence Against the Dark Arts. Kind of looks like what, uh, what Sirius looks like. And he's not laughing as well. Oh no, he's not laughing in the movie, is he? He's just screaming, isn't he? <coughs> yeah, for some reason I thought he's laughing, but no, he, he, he's screaming. In fact, I think I've got a note down here that apparently after he kill, after he killed the thirteen uh, people, he then started laughing. But uh, yes, here we go. Farmhouse jumped out of the way of the bus, which is amazing. <laughs> oh, uh, the the reason why that happens is that because Harry actually says Voldemort in the in the movie he he, he doesn't. In fact, Stan actually brings up Voldemort. Uh, and uh, so in the in the book, Harry like says Voldemort in the sentence, and Ernie's like, <laughs> like he just like completely knocks her, knocks him for six, and that's why the farmhouse literally has to jump out of the way of the bus. I thing is, guys, I keep I keep wanting to say I wish that it was in the movie, but you know what? I don't because I think the movie sequence is nigh on perfect. I really do. I thought it was great. You know what? The bus does teleport to London. Unless it doesn't. I feel like it teleports at first and then is driving through London. I don't know. I'll have to, to rewatch it. It ain't a big thing anyway. So Stan actually brings up Harry Potter. And I was thinking that wouldn't Stan recognise Harry from the scar straight away. Because he does like says, what's that on your head? And so then Harry's like, like this. But I was thinking that the fact that... The fact that Stan is like so shocked that Harry... Um, doesn't know about Sirius Black... The fact that he doesn't instantly think Scar in the head, Harry Potter. But um, maybe Sirius isn't really linked to to James and Lily publicly as much as we're we're led to believe. So, but, so yeah, maybe he would have made that connection anyway. Um, so yes, Sirius killed one wizard and uh, no. Oh yes, one wizard and twelve Muggles. Or did I get that the wrong way around? Yes, no, that is right. Yeah, 12 muggles in front of witnesses and apparently was laughing 
uh, so, so, so when it happened, um, he started to laugh um, until the mystery, uh, when when the mystery members came to arrest him. You would imagine if if that is true, that Sirius would have had a spell put on him. I'm sure that that will get covered in the book, though. So so we will we will find out eventually. Uh, do we do we do we do? Uh, so yes, now this is the first time we hear about Azkaban Guards, um, which is a term used a lot in these chapters, and I really like the fact it's holding back on that, because would these things publicly be known as Dementors? It's not exactly uh, a, you know, a name which makes you sleep well at night, you know what I mean? And so it does. It, it's interesting that everyone is referred, or maybe they're not referred to Dementors at all in the book, but um, I'd imagine they probably are. But at the moment, they keep on talking about these uh, Azkaban guards and how amazing they are and how, and how uh, you know, it makes people shudder when they think about them. Uh, yes, in fact, yeah, w w when Stan mentions Azkaban guards, Ernie uh, actually says, uh, it asks them to change the subject. And so there you go. Um, Harry actually starts to think about what Stan is going to be talking about in the future. Um, I, th I think uh, do, 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 do. I think that if if uh, if Stan, yeah, I think that Harry's thinking if Stan does work out who who he is, he's imagining the future conversations that he's going to be having with other passengers uh, about the fact that that Harry Potter was on on this bus when when this event happened. Um, like I say, Stan seems so much nicer. He really doesn't in he really doesn't in the book, and so that's why Harry's thinking about what what he's going to be telling people in the future about him. Uh, he, Harry is definitely feel, feeling a lot of guilt over what he did to Marge, but not for her. But he feels really very very bad about about what what he did. Then again, he did say the line uh, she she deserved it, but. Ever since leaving the house, and because the bus scene is so much calmer in the book, it really puts over the fact that Harry is really feeling quite terrible about the fact that he broke the rules, you know, uh, in this way. You know, for for a selfish pur for selfish purposes, he keeps on bringing up the fact that he's going to get expelled from Hogwarts and possibly go to Azkaban. So, um, feeling guilt may may, may uh, remorse may be a little bit more of a better term. Either way. Uh, yeah, so this is where I got about the t telephone booth in the telephone box, but it's it's, it's a very boring detail. <laughs> I, I found it interesting, the fact that it's different on the two different audiobooks. So yes, the, the, the bus drops uh, Harry off at the leaky tap, and as soon as he gets out, basically a hand is on his shoulder straight away and it's fudge right there in the street which does make sense it does make sense that he'd actually be outside like you know waiting for him in, in a way um and yeah i don't think in the book he actually mentions marge potentially until harry mentions it it's certainly not the first thing. Uh, Har uh, Fudge's thing in the book is is a lot more. Oh, you're right. That's that's good. How are you? You're safe and everything. It's good that you're here and everything. He's not really like saying. But but, in, but literally the first thing that he doesn't even say hello. Basically the first thing that happens when Harry gets le led into the room where Fudge is in the in the in the movie, um, Cordelius is instantly talking about what happened with Marge. I guess that kind of makes sense just to get it out of the way. But book one is definitely a lot more concerned and happy that Harry is there. The fact that, that they know that he is safe, which is obviously putting over the thing that Harry doesn't know about even more. Um, so yes, uh, when when, uh, when Fudge refers to Harry as Harry, there was not a stand it's like, who's, who's Harry? And like, who, why are you calling him Harry? Um, and then when, when it's revealed that, you know, Harry is Harry Potter, uh, Stan turns to Ern and says, guess who Neville is, Ern? <laughs> Amazing. Um, in the movie, in the movie, um, yeah, this is, this, this, this doesn't make sense, guys. There's a line in the movie which doesn't make any sense to me. When they, when they, when the bus is stopped, you know, dropped off Harry at, at, at Diagon Alley, uh, Lenny Henry, the shrunken head, 
then says, next stop, Nocturne Alley. What? No, 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 no. Harry is at the Leaky Cauldron. Have I been going to get the Leaky Tap again? I feel like I have. But uh, Harry is at the Leaky Cauldron because he wants to get to Diagon Alley. Um, and so there would not be a separate bus stop for Nocturne Alley. Unless Nocturne Alley is the biggest area in the world or something. The, one of the first right turns going through... Oh, but that's the... One of the first right turns in the movie in Diagon Alley takes you to Nocturne Alley. Like, just like a couple of feet down there. Why would there, why would there be another bus stop for Nocturne Alley? Or maybe it's a secretive thing. So you get rid of all the people going to Diagon Alley and then, so the bus only has Nocturne Alley people. I'm trying to justify it, but it seems ridiculous that in the movie there's another stop for Nocturne Alley. Um, anyway. So, yes, we fight. Now, I, I had no idea that the Leaker Cauldron, um, for one, I didn't realise that uh, Tom in, in um, Prince of Azkaban, the movie, was the owner of Leaky Tap. And that character is also in The Philosopher's Stone, but is done, played by a completely different actor. The, the one from The Philosopher's Stone has actually been on a lot of things, guys. In fact, I think he's actually in Star Wars, in fact. Um, the, the, the one which is in Prince of Azkaban is a comedian in the UK. Uh, you most definitely haven't heard of him if you're not from the UK, guys. Um, you may have heard of Lee Mack. And not maybe Tim Vine, but you you may have heard of Lee Mack if you watched a bit of British television. Um, him and this guy who plays Tom uh, were, were on a show like long ago, like 20 years ago. Um, like a sketch show sort of thing. But yeah, it was strange seeing him in uh, Prison of Asgard. Nice to see him. Um, so yes, yeah, Tom, the, the, the guy who almost lo lo looks like a um, Igor-esque character. In Prince of Azkaban is actually the owner of the Leaky Tap. I didn't realise that for a second. I got it. I got to admit. Um, so yes, yeah, Stan is still calling uh, Harry Neville even at the end. I think he actually says "by Neville" to him, even though he knows that it's Harry Potter at this point. Um, Fudge seems very frustrated at Harry um, here after after the initial relief of, of knowing that he's all right. Uh, he like goes to say, I was starting to think, but you're safe and that's all that matters. And so he's really, th he's worried about Black at this point. Now, the subtlety of the way that it's done in the movie, I didn't pick up on that. I really didn't, guys. Having now gone back and done it, uh, and uh, uh, having uh, having read the book and, and re-watching the scene, the actor does do a very good job, but it was too subtle for me. Because I didn't realise that that was why... You know, that's why Fudge was being lenient on him or anything like this. This is all stuff which went completely over my head um, when watching the movie. So yes, it's obvious that he's frustrated, but he's, and he's like saying, I'm starting to think potentially he's going to say Sirius Black may have got to him, something like that. Um, it's actually Fudge in the movie that actually brings up Black, in fact. Um... He like, like says in these times we're like a, uh, a crazed killer on the loose. He actually mentions it to Harry, whereas here I think that is the way round. I don't think that Fudge actually mentions Black in any specific way. He does seem to be a lot more just happy that that Harry is is safe. Um, but Harry straight away is very sus about what's going on with Fudge. Why Fudge would be there as well would just makes no sense to him, which is. A very fair point. Why would it be the Prime Minister there, is what I'm saying, rather than just an agent? Um, so yes, uh, we hear about two members of the Accidental Magic re Reversal, which is an amazing uh, role, uh, went over to, and uh, wiped Marge's memory. At first I was thinking, why wouldn't they do the Dursleys as well? But there's no point. There's no, there's no point. There's, you just do uh, Marge. And I guess, in a way, it's a lesson learned to the Dursleys, in, in, a, in a way. Well, well from, from the Ministry standpoint, it's like, yeah, you should keep your kid in, in control. Under control. But they obviously don't know what the Dursleys are like. So they don't know that they're actually scared of Harry as well. Um, we do, however, hear that the Dursleys are willing to have Harry back. Which is very interesting, guys. Because this does feel like a moment where... 
they could have kind of gotten out of the responsibility of looking after Harry. Because quite frankly, there isn't a reason why um, the Dursleys didn't just give Harry to an orphanage, is there? Not, not that I can think of. Because Harry isn't pretending to be their son. Because... No, he's not. Because Aunt Marge knows about James and, and Lily. Unless she's kept a secrecy as well. No, of course she isn't. Because she doesn't know about the Wizarding World. So yeah, Harry must publicly not... Must publicly be known to not be the Dursley's son. So why... So what is the reason why they wouldn't give him to the orphanage? Knowing what these characters are like. Unless they're just against giving children to orphanages. I don't know, guys. I, I, that, that, that's something that's only really just dawned on me. Anyway. It's the fact that the Dursleys say that they're willing to have him back. They do say as long as he stays there for Christmas and Easter. And Harry's like, well, that's the case anyway. If there isn't a reason why the Dursleys have to or want to keep Harry around, this does feel like a moment where they could have got rid of him. I don't know. I feel like I'm missing something here, guys. You, you, you fill in the blanks. You know what I'm like. So Harry then does point out the discrepancy of what's going on where with, with, with what happened with Dobby. He actually specifically mentions uh, the, the the Dobby incident, incident without men naming names, of course, and says, "How come then I was getting threatened with expulsion, and now it's no big deal to blow up your your aunt?" Very good point. Um. And Fudge actually starts a sentence and he says, well, in the present climate, and then just changes the subject straight away. So he's really, it's very political. I mean, the, in the present climate is, it, climate is something which a lot of politicians say, at least over here. Um, but then he just completely swerves and just goes into another com conversation about something else. It's very good. I, I find Fudge to be a fascinating character, actually. I really do. Da -da 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 -da. Oh, yes. Yeah, it's so odd. Actually, you know what? I don't mind this change. So in the movie, um, Fudge like says, oh, here's your books for the year, by the way. Now, that that does make more sense to me. Because um, that Fudge has got all his books together. And he actually says to Harry, best that you don't go anywhere. So I'm pretty sure that ha Harry is essentially under house arrest at this point. The fact that he actually can't leave the Leaky Cauldron. He can't go into Diagon Alley. At, in the movie this is, at no point do we see Harry in Diagon Alley in Prince of Azkaban. And so, which does make sense, guys, because surely Sirius would be able to get into uh, uh, Diagon Alley no problem, right? And so Diagon Alley is not that safe a place for Harry. We've definitely seen Death Eaters in, in, uh, in Diagon Alley, in, in future movies, of course. Uh, and so, quite frankly, it makes more sense that ha that uh, Fudge is kind of keeping him under house arrest in, in this way. Whereas, in, in, in the book, he has to go and get all, all the rest of his books himself. Obviously, Fudge gives him the monster book of monsters in the, uh, in the movie version, whereas, obviously, you know, which means that Hagrid didn't get him a birthday present. Unbelievable, but um, yeah, I thought that, that I, I I think that was a smart change actually. The fact that Harry does feel a lot more locked in, and quite frankly, the the, the Leaky Cauldron seems less of a nice place in the movie as well. Not that it's not that it's a terrible place, but you know Harry having the room right next to the rail line, and like whenever a train goes past, dust is coming down from the ceiling and everything. Uh, the 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 book room seems sounds really quite nice, quite old school, but very very pleasant. He's got a mirror that keeps on talking to him, which we will get to in a moment. Um, presumably that mirror is well, not an employee, but it's you know it's it's it's. I'd imagine trained to say nice things, quite frankly, because it's in a hotel. You don't want to get get any complaints. Um, but yes, uh, the Leaky Cauldron definitely seems like a a, a cheaper place in, in in the movie. 
but yeah, um, Harry is now uh, basically his own man. You know, in the next chapter, we'll get into it about how he has this new sense of freedom that he's never experienced before, and new responsibilities like you know keeping control of your money and everything. It's a a big you know experience for for Harry in, in the book. Whereas in the in the movie, it's like no, no, you're you're staying here. Don't go anywhere. Um, although it is heavily hinted that Tom is going to be keeping an eye on Harry, and I think that Fudge you know says it, hoping that it sounds like. Tom will look after you. What it actually means is Tom's going to be keeping an eye on you. <laughs> and so, yeah, um, there is that. Yeah, he is told not to go out into Muggle London. And so he is allowed to go into Wizarding London. Uh, Diagon Alley. Wizarding London, I would call it. Um, yeah, Harry br brings up Black to Fudge rather than uh, Fudge mentioning that there's a crazed murderer on the loose and everything. And again, we have Fudge mentioning these Azkaban guards. It's very interesting the fact that they're not being called Dementors yet. And the fact we, we know that they're, they're hardcore, but we don't know why, though. Very good, very good. Um, oh, yes, Harry asks Fudge if he could sign the Hogsmeade letter. Now, that, to me, is ingenious. I wouldn't have thought of that for a second. But Fudge is so shady at this point. But he's like saying, oh, no, no. I, I, no, it has to be your, your, your parental guardian. I, I can't do it. And Harry's like, but you're the Prime Minister. If you were to do it, then no one would argue with it. And then he, and like, um, and this is when, like, uh, Fudge, like, says, uh, you'll be able to go next year. Which, to Harry, hearing that, makes no sense. Because why would it, why, why would Fudge be saying you can go next year? Well, what's the discrepancy between this year and next year to Harry, considering that Harry doesn't know that Black has something to do with him? And so, I, I like that. I, I like that. It's like Fudge not doing a very good job at being secretive at this point. And, um, and yeah, the, the room seems genuinely nice. Harry goes into it and Hed Hedwig is, is, is right that. He says that he's got two Dursley free, uh, Dursley free weeks before the start of uh, term. It's very interesting that we have this, guys, because it's very similar to... Um, it really is. Um, I think he actually won the poll, actually. I said about the changes that are in um, Chamber of Secrets. And which scene would you have liked to have seen in the movie? And I don't know if it actually won, but it was certainly one of the top options. Uh, people said... The month where Harry gets to spend with the Dursley, the, the, the Weasley, sorry, and how much that changes his character and like how much he learns about all the different um, members of it and everything, and how he and how it's his first experience of a peaceful, happy family life. Um, I think that may have won the poll, saying by from you guys saying that that's what you would have wanted to see in in the movie. No, it wasn't. No, I think it was uh, Ron telling Hermione about Mudbloods. I think it was that. But I know that the month with the Dursleys, the Weasleys, did do very well. And this scene, what we're going to be covering in the next chapter, is basically this book's version of that. Where it's the time between getting away from the Dursleys, having a good time, and then heading off to school. And so it's a great chapter that we'll be covering next, guys. And so uh, lots of notes as always. Uh, and one thing I did notice at the uh, notice when re-watching the, the scenes from the movie. You know the cleaner in the movie who like knocks on the door, says housekeeping and like opens the door and it's just like Wah! and then slams in her face and she says, I'll come back later. She's not a hag, because hags are dangerous things that you don't want to mess around with in the wizarding world. She looks like a stereotypical witch. But Hermione's a witch. <laughs> and so it's so strange that she's the only person, the only witch. If that is meant to be a witch that is doing housekeeping, it's the only witch that looks like a witch. Which makes me question, where are all the other witch-looking witches? Because not even, not even the slivery witches look anything like her. Like I said, it could be a hag. We get mention of a hag in the next chapter, but Harry suspects that she's a hag. Yeah. Let me know. Let me know in the comments. Um, either way, 
great chapter, but gotta say, movie did it as well. Very different, but as good in my opinion. It's so fun. It's such a fun sequence, that bus scene. It really is. Um, so let's move on to something which is not in the movie at all, apart from one bit, so it isn't a movie. <laughs> Chapter 4, The Leaky Cauldron. Harry starts to adapt to his newfound freedom in Diagon Alley. He finishes off his uh, third year uh, shopping list, purchases new robes, meets up with a few other Gryffindorians, which I'm not sure is, uh, is a term or not, uh, and gazes in wonder at the new hottest broomstick on the market, the Firebolt. On the last day, he finally meets up with Ron and Hermione. Hermione has a, a bulging bag of books as she is taking several more sub uh, optional subjects this year. Ron's rat Scabbers is looking under the weather, so the trio visit the local pet store. While there, Scabbers is snatched by a large uh, ginger cat called Crookshanks. Hermione, who, is, who was interested in buying an owl like H Harry and the Weasleys, changes her mind and purchases cro Crookshanks for herself. The group return to the Liliki Cauldron and meet up with the rest of the of the Weasleys. Arva talks about all the effort being put into hunting down Black in the, by the Ministry. Percy is acting very smug and pretentious, much to the enjoyment of Fred and George. At dinner, Arthur explains that the Ministry have provided cars for them to take to uh, King's Cross Station. Uh, this seems to be very unusual to everyone, but Arthur says it's, it was simply a favour that they owed him. That evening, Harry overhears Ron and uh, Percy um, arguing. Percy's head boy badge had, uh, and Scabbers' rat tonic had gone missing. Harry offers to look for the tonic, but on his way, overhears Arthur and Molly arguing uh, as well. They seem to be talking about Harry not knowing the truth regarding Sirius Black's breakout and that Harry could be very well uh, be a target. His target, I should say. They also say that Dumbledore has reluctantly allowed the Azkaban Guard to patrol Hogwarts in case Black attempts to infiltrate it. Um, after finding the tonic, Harry returns it to Ron and bumps into Fred and George, who have stolen Percy's badge and changed it to say Big Head Boy. I, I love this stuff with Percy, guys. I really do. I did, I did not expect... I, we, you guys always said about how Ginny was really hard done by in the, in the movies. But my goodness, I love every single scene with Percy and guys, and that's no exception here as well. Um, and everyone's so mean to him as well. It's only Molly that isn't at, th at this point, or at least in, in these scenes, which we will get to anyway. Uh, so yeah, Harry like, has newfound freedom and all the you know, benefits and you know, detractors of that. He decides when he, when he eats, what he eats and everything. But he also is having to learn to be very frugal and not to just blow all his money uh, straight away. Um, so yes, yeah, two weeks in Diagon Alley, which is, like I say, very similar to the month with the Weasleys in Chamber of Secrets. So it's just like a, a moment for him to have have a, a better time than, than he does at the Dursleys before actually heading over to Hogwarts. Um, so I would have liked to see that in a movie, but again, you can't have everything in the movie. And quite frankly, the movies, like I said, um, Fudge saying to, to Harry that he shouldn't leave the Leaky Cauldron does make more sense to me at least but you know let me know your comments in, in in the comments we get these wonderful bits and they're possibly my favorite parts of these books where we get a list so often it's um harry looks over um molly weasley's bookshelf and like reads all the titles and by the names and everything like that or it could be all sorts of different situations where it's just like a list of, of different things that we're learning about lessons and everything like that but um here it's just harry like observing people it, 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 who are frequenting the uh, leaky cauldron like all the different witches and wizards that, that, that are passing through. He does notice that there is this uh, a, a woman who looks suspiciously like a hag um, who's ordering raw liver raw liver, uh, and wearing a thick wooden bal balaclava, which is an image. But yes, that's very interesting. Because hags, you wouldn't have friendly hags, would you? No. Not if, um, not if, um, oh my, Lockhart's books or anything to go on which obviously they're not <laughs> um so yeah harry uh, like is visiting our uh, florin for fortis Cruz ice cream uh parlor 
And Florian is actually helping him out with his homework and everything and giving Harry like uh, free su ice cream sundaes every half an hour, which is amazing. I presume that's why, I, I presume that's because he really is enjoying helping him out with the homework. And so he just wants to, wants to keep him there, maybe. Or maybe it's because it's Harry Potter, you never know. Um, it's very, you know what, guys? This is strange. Them all having to do homework during the summer. I never remember having to do any homework during the summer at all. Not even like writing papers or anything like that. Or maybe I did, but I certainly don't remember it. Uh, you know, in the schools that I went to, summer holidays were summer holidays, and you you got to do exactly what you wanted until the end, and then you got back to um, b back to learning. But yes, homework during the summer holidays. Um, so yes, Harry is tempted to buy some golden gob, gob, gobstones or globstones? Gobstones, I can't remember which one it was. It's like a marbles, but uh, whenever a player loses a point, apparently foul liquid like sprays out of the pool, which is horrible. Uh, I did actually look it up just to try and uh, understand visually what these things look like. And when I did, it came up with several screenshots of video games. So I'm guessing that this... That, that that gobstones is a playable mini game in uh, the original Harry Potter series games, which I do want to cover, guys. I actually really, really do. I mean, that'd be really cool to do some streams on that. Obviously, we got uh, Hogwarts Legacy coming up as well, and I wonder if it's going to be in Hog Hogwarts Legacy because Marbles is obviously a pretty old school game, and so you'd imagine that Golden Gobstones it would also be pretty old. I know. I, I'm in two minds about when Hogwarts Legacy is set, you know. Because there is something very, very 90s about Harry Potter, obviously, because it takes part in it part in the 90s. But a lot of references are very, very strong references to the 90s, you know. So putting it at a time so far before, I guess the reason why they do that is so that they can write their own uh, legacy or history. Um, without it being having any risk of it affecting the events of Harry Potter, you know what I mean? Or Fantastic Beasts, I presume, as well. Um, they, they, they've done that with Star Wars as well, where they've had, like, RPGs which are set, like, centuries before the events of Star Wars, you know what I mean? What, what, what was it called? What the hell was that? What the hell were they called? They're really good. Knights of the Old Republic, that's right, isn't it? I never played the multiplayer uh, MMO one, but uh, Knights of the Old Republic, I I played the heck out of the uh, those two. One and two. Two was never finished, but the first one was awesome. Can I, can I even say this? It's not a spoiler to say that, it, that at one point there is a very good twist in it. There we go. I'll leave it at that. I'll leave it at that. If you know, if you know, you know. <laughs> but anyway, back to Harry Potter, not Star Wars. Um... So yeah, he notices that there's a crowd inside the Quidditch store, and so and which is his favourite shop, which is uh, which makes a lot of sense. And it's the Bloom and Firebolt guys, and like uh, Harry, again, he's like saying, "I really want to put." He, he doesn't even want to know what the price is. <laughs> I think I think I think um, it, there's a sign saying "price on request" or something like that. So you have to actually ask for it to show interest to find out how much it costs. But Harry's like, "No, I, I don't want to know. I don't want to know because I will just spend it all." Um, which is very interesting because I think I'm pretty sure the first time we hear about the firebolt in the movie is literally the last scene. I think so. I think so. Um, yeah, we hear that the Irish team have put in a, a, an order for them and how they're the favourites to win the next World Cup, which I presume actually is the World Cup that they attend in Goblet. Because obviously the World Cup only takes place every four years, or, or football World Cup, I should say. I'd imagine that's probably the same for Quidditch as well. It does mention that Harry's never lost a, a match of Quidditch, which I didn't think was the case. I know that they that uh, Gryffindor has lost um, when um, Harry's been, you know, unable to attend the game. But Harry never losing to me, guys. I, I remember when we first started these book reviews. In fact, it may have been even... No, it was. It was during the movie reactions and I was like saying, I really want to know the rules of Quidditch and everything. I got a lot of comments saying, it's clear that the author doesn't really understand understand sport. Um, 
And I get that from the rules and everything, but also having it that Harry has literally never lost a game of Quidditch. I feel like that's also not um, not understanding sport as well, you know? Because having lost a game isn't like a, a disgrace or anything in, in any sport, even boxing. Just because you've lost like one match doesn't mean that's it, your career's over. Um... I guess it's trying to put over the events that will be happening later on in this book, maybe? But it seems childish. Oh, this is going to sound bad, guys. It sounds like childish writing. The fact that Harry's never lost a Quidditch match. Well, it's a team sport. Ah, oh, man, it bothers me, you know? It bothers me. But then whenever Harry isn't a part of the game then they're allowed to lose. You know what I mean? Oh, man. I hope I, I hope I don't sound too harsh today, guys, but it does seem a little bit, um, like, <laughs> like a 13-year-old written it. I don't mean, okay, that, that, uh, that was definitely badly put. What I'm saying is, as someone who watches a bit of sports, you know, saying that Harry's literally never lost a Quidditch match, it doesn't, it, it's not, it's not that it's unrealistic. It sounds almost as if, the writer doesn't understand that losing is just a part of sport. Ah, oh, I'm moving on. I'm moving on, guys, because I've got to start an argument in, in, in the comments. Let me know if you agree. Let me know if you disagree. And we'll discuss it. I, I want to know your thoughts on that. Um, so, uh, Harry has chosen magical creatures and divination, which, thank goodness, actually explained what divination is in, in this chapter. Um, so, he's already got his monster book of monsters when he goes to Flourish and Blots. I gotta say, guys, whenever I hear about Flourish and Blots, the first thing that pops into my head is Borgen and Burks. So, when, it, when he said, uh, uh, so he went to Flourish and Blots, I was like, wait, wait, what? Really? Uh, he's going back there? Why? No, it's Borgen and Burks. It's the similar names. Flourish and Blots, Bo Borgen and Burks. To me, they're similar names. And I think only me. <laughs> but, um,. And uh, when he walks in, like, the shop owner's like, oh, my God, I had to get the blooming monster books out. And puts on these really thick gloves and everything. He sounds actually really, really quite annoyed. Um, but then, like, he's, he's like, he's, I think, he, I don't think he, says, he says, thank God. But, he's, he, like, he's, he, he says, he's absolutely relieved when Harry says that he's already got, got, got one. Um, and, like, he, he, the shopkeeper is saying that it's, that it's um, the worst thing that, that that's the bookstore has done. Uh, getting those in since um, th they ordered 200 copies of the Invisible Book of Invisibility, which is... <laughs> it's funny, but it also doesn't make any sense. But it's, it's, absolutely, it's completely hilarious, though, obviously. Presumably Dumbledore will be able to help them out. He's good to go, they're there, mate. Maybe. Unless he can't see... You see, see this is the whole thing with invisibility, exactly how it works. Um, they also need just like powerful wizard to be able to see them, but yeah. But then what's the point? Because if you had to be able to, oh, I, I'm thinking too much about it. It's a silly line. I'm going to leave. I'm going to leave it at that. Um, so then we get another list of all these uh, fortune telling books and everything, the names and the authors and everything. Like I say, I just love that sort of thing. It, it's it's some of my favourite stuff in these books where we just hear about. You know, a list of all these different things about a different subject and everything. I think it's awesome. Uh, Harry then eyes a um, a book on death omens. Uh, uh, yeah, death omens. And notices that the uh, the dog on the front of it looks very si similar to the dog that he saw. Um, and it's it's a nice line where the owner uh, when, when like Harry like notices it and the owner is like saying, you know, D don't be going into that. Um, you'll start seeing omens everywhere, which is so true. It really is. It's like, you know, I guess it's similar to, uh, this really might get put on a list if I say the wrong term, but it might be happen it ha it's similar to what happened a couple of, you know, for a couple of years recently. You know what I mean? Um, and like everyone started to, you know, feel stuff in the back of the throat and everything and, and think, oh, oh, hang on, have I got something? Or not, you know, the, but the more you think about something, the more you're going to start seeing things that will, um, you know, prove your your thinking. Ah, there's a good term for it. I can't... Confirmation bias? Is that the right term? 
where you're you're seeing what your brain is expecting rather than what is actually happening. Oh man. I really like the line. I really like that line. Um so Harry like pops back and is like thinking about the death homes and everything like that. And instinctively just like pats his hair down at the the mirror and like then says, You're losing a fight you're 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 fighting a losing battle there, my dear, which is adorable. I hope that the you know, the mirror does shut up at night. <laughs> Because that would be very annoying. Um, you'd imagine so. Um, so yeah, Harry's still waiting for Ron and Hermione to to to, to visit. Because obviously Ron did say about meeting up in London. He does see Seamus and Dean there, and he also sees the real Neville Longbottom, which he refers to, which is amazing. The grandmother's there as well, and I've got down here that is potentially the first time that we've seen. Pardon me. Uh, that Neville's grandmother has actually been in person, but I have a feeling that she was in Chamber uh, Philosopher's Stone. I have a feeling that Harry noticed a kid with a toad before getting on the train, and so I think that we have at least seen her. And the the grandmother's giving Neville a hard time, and. Um, Harry does think to himself that I hope that she never finds out that, that uh, Harry used Neville's name uh, in the way that he did. Um, so yeah, uh, Ron and Hermione are then there. I, I think they're actually outside potentially um, uh, Florin Fortescue having ice cream, I believe. They're, they're having uh, some sort of meal somewhere. Um, and Harry, like, says, how did you know that I was staying at the Leaky Cauldron? And uh, Rod says, Dad. Which, to me, seems like an incredibly bad security risk. Arthur telling Ron where Harry is almost seems out of character, because Arthur is childlike, but he's not an idiot. I was going to say he's not like Hagrid then. Oh, I apologize for what I nearly said there, guys. But Arthur, when he's serious, is serious, is what I'm trying to say, you know. And so, Arthur telling Ron that Harry's there, I mean, jeez. And obviously, Ron doesn't know why everyone's being hush hush about where Harry is. And so, Ron would probably be going right and say, Oh, yeah, Harry's over. And uh, I don't know. Yeah, it seems like an odd, odd thing that Arthur would tell Ron where Harry is. Um, and when, when uh, I think that I think that they've already already know about what happened with Marge, and like Hermione's like saying, "Did you really do that?" And like almost giving him a, giving him a ticking off whilst Ron's having laughing his head off in the background. <laughs> um, Ron does say that uh, if the Ministry uh, came out to him for blowing up their their, their, their his aunt, uh, they would have to dig him up because uh, because his mum would have already killed him, which is amazing. Which is amazing. Um, so yeah, Hermione's taking all these new subjects and everything. I'm really glad that Ron pointed out. This is something which I think I brought up several times in Chamber of Secrets, guys. Why would a muggle take muggle studies? Because one, it's going to be kind of redundant. Or two, incredibly easy. Um, but then Hermione does say that it, it'll be interesting to see it from the perspective of wizards and the wizarding world and so i do understand it a bit more now it's not you know it's not what do muggles have for breakfast or anything like that it's about the nature of them and the culture of them and so and how that is reflective and different from the wizarding world and so i get it now i get i kind of get it now that, that that muggles would be not muggles sorry but uh sorry half bloods uh, would be interested in taking Muggle studies or Muggle borns, not Muggles themselves, of course. Do squibs go to Hogwarts? Do do squibs? Oh, because ne Neville didn't think that he was a wizard until the last second, did he? Because he he thought that he was going to be a squib. So if it is confirmed before you're eleven that you are a squib. Or likely a squib. Do you then still go to Hogwarts? Because you're not going to be able to do most of the lessons. So what is... Is there like squib education at Hogwarts? Or is there somewhere else that squibs go to? That's a... Okay, let me know your theories on that. That ain't, That's not even my notes. That just came off out, out, out my stupid mouth. 
But uh, that's uh, that's interesting. They're not going to force squibs to try and do magic, like fly brooms and stuff like that, are they? Hmm. Or levitate or like a, a, a feather if they literally just cannot do it. Where do squibs get educated, guys? That is a very interesting question. Or do they get... No, because some squibs wouldn't know the muggle world at all. And so you can't have a squib then go to muggle school because they can't do what their parents could do. Oh, it's sad. It's why I find um, Philp so interesting. And the other script that I can't remember the bloomer name of. Anyway. Um, bah, 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 bah. um of course Percy was actually suggesting that Harry take muggle studies and said play to your strengths and everything. And so um I guess Percy was suggesting that Muggle Studies would be a walk for him. So you'd imagine that uh, Muggleborns and people who've lived, grown up with Muggles, um, would have an easier time of it going on what Percy says. But what going on Hermione says is not that simple. Anyway, I find that fascinating. Um, Hermione wants an owl, um, and and like says, uh, like, like like you've got Errol and and Harry's got a Hedwig. And Ron straight away is like, hey, 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 I don't have Errol. Er er Errol is the family. All I've got is Scabbers. This is this Ron putting, not putting his family down, but like downplaying him him and being uncon not unconscious, sorry, uh, being um, overly conscious about his, uh, his family's financial uh, situation. So, I mean, this is from the first thing with Ron on the train in uh, uh, Philosopher's Stone. It really has been a, like a, a thing where every now and then Ron is like putting himself down and kind of putting his family down, but in a loving way. I mean, it, it, he like says, all I've got is, is, is Scabbers and he's not looking that great. But then in the next scene, he's blooming defending Scabbers when like the uh, when the rats in the store are like, you know, the, the, I think they're doing jump rope. With, with their tails and like this shopkeeper like says well, why don't you get a replacement one of these and Ron straight away says show offs to uh, at the the rats who are doing it so he is defensive of scabbers even though uh, he does have this um, not paranoia but you know a, a thing about about scabbers and Errol and so on it's very interesting I guess it's because other people well Draco for, for a prime example would have said this to him and put it in his mind maybe yeah, very interesting. We hear about all the different amazing, um, or fantastic, I should say, creatures inside the pet store. There's a jeweled, jewel encrusted tortoise, which sounds amazing. There's a rabbit, which keeps on turning into a top hat. And quite frankly, guys, if I went into that shop, that would be that would be it. I, I don't care if I went in after an owl or a cat or anything. I would come out of there with a rabbit that turns into the hat. That sounds absolutely amazing. Um... So yeah, we hear about Scabbers, uh, the fact that Scabbers has no powers, which kind of makes sense, although he should, he, he could, he cut, he cut. When someone has turned into a creature, can they then still use magic? Werewolves, I would imagine not, but conscious animals. Hmm. You'd imagine, um, unless he has to use the wand, you should, I don't know, again. It's a very minor thing. We find out that it's missing a toe, which is obviously very uh, significant to later on. And um, the shopkeep suggests some rat tonic to try and bring scabbers around. Um, yes, yeah, so then we have the crookshanks. Now, I've, I've got down here that that, that uh, crookshank grabbed scabbers. I'm not sure if that's actually true, but it obviously went for scabbers. Um, much bigger. In in the uh, in the book compared to the movie, the movie it's just a normal sized cat. Um, Harry remarks that it's either a large cat or a small tiger. Um, I got down here that it, that it's ginger as well, but it is ginger in the movie as well. It's got a very, it, it, they cast the right cat for it as well because it does have the very flat face. Um, so when like uh, Ron is like uh, consoling Scabbers, making sure that he's all right, Hermione comes out of the shop holding Crookshank, saying that she's just purchased him. I wonder if the shopkeep um, 
saw weakness in Hermione. <laughs> Because apparently the shopkeeper had said that nobody wanted Crookshanks and that Crookshanks has been there for ages. And Hermione being the person that she would is, that would probably go a long way with. So maybe the shopkeeper used a little bit of, <laughs> you know, uh, trading skills there. But, you know, it worked. Hermione bought, it, bought him straight away. Um, I, I, when, when I rewatched the scenes, because obviously it's, it's very strange... It's like two scenes in Leaky Cauldron rather than all these wonderful scenes in Diagon Alley that we get in the book. But in the movie, um, Ron and Hermione are really having a go at each other. Like, they really are. And they're actually insulting each other's pets, like, properly. Uh, Hermione calls uh, Scabbers a s s uh, smelly old shoe brush. And Ron, d uh, like, it s says that Crush acts like a pig or something like that. I can't remember exactly what. Hermione does also say that it's in his nature to ch ch chase Scabbers. And that isn't something that book Hermione would say. Yeah, that that I can't imagine. I I would get I would get the impression that book Hermione would be a lot more like Hagrid is, where Hagrid will criticize Ron for getting bitten by uh, by the dragon. Um where you know you know Hermione will find uh, anything else to blame rather than Crookshanks, but to say that it's in Crookshanks' nature to to attack Scabbers, that ain't that ain't book Hermione at all. Obviously, they are very different characters. Book Hermione and movie Hermione. I mean, they're both brilliant. I personally think that uh, book Hermione is a better character, but um, that line when I was re-listening to it, I was thinking, there's no way book Hermione would say that it's in Crookshanks' nature. Unless she did, and I just missed it. Because I've done this before. I've done this before where it says, Th that, that would never happen. And then it did happen. But I just missed it whilst listening to the audiobook. So I don't think that happened. Um, I don't think it did. I apologise if it did. If, if it, if it did. Uh, but anyway. Um, so yeah, then they go back and the rest of the Weasleys are there. They're all um, in, in very good spirits and everything, which is always lovely to see. Um... Arthur is talking about Sirius back and all the effort that's got, gone into capturing him. And Ron says that if, if they would get a reward for capturing Black. And it's very interesting because we get that line. And then at the end of this chapter, we get a line from Harry as well. Really showing the confidence that the last two years have given the three. The fact that Ron would even think for a second, oh, maybe we could catch him is purely down to the adventures that they've had for the last two years and so and all, like i say there was also a line at the end of the chapter where harry is saying do they not think i can't take care of myself because he's defeated voldemort twice so they're they're, they're they are um not evolving what's the term i guess evolving is kind of right they're, they're evolving into confident people because they've been successful these two times but it's a big, it's not a big step up because obviously Voldemort's Voldemort, but Voldemort has never been his full self though. This is a real person who, who has, you know, it's interesting that they have this confidence and Ron would think for a second, hey, maybe we should deal with this. It's cool. It's, it's, it's show, show, showing the, the evolution of the characters. Uh, again, we hear about the Azkaban guards. I'm liking the fact that, that, that this is a thing which is being referred to. I'm guessing that at some point they will be called Dementors as well. Maybe it's a nickname. Um, Percy being very... I don't think he is being smug, actually. I, I say smug. I don't think that's the right word. He's just... He's very proud, and there's nothing wrong with that, guys. And Fred and George are mercilessly mocking him. <laughs> I say, absolutely spiffing. And like, Mom... <laughs> really corking to see you to Molly, which is amazing. <laughs> Even though she's been there the whole time. <laughs> Stupid. Uh, they also uh, attempted to uh, shut, lock Percy up in a pyramid as well, but uh, Molly stopped. Um, so yes, the Ministry is providing them cars to get to um, the train station the next day. Um, Fred and George do suggest that it that it's because of Percy being being the the head boy now, and that they're gonna have HB on the on the on the little flags on the bonnet, because, meaning humongous big head. Um, everyone laughs it. it. It does say everyone laughs except for Percy and, and, and Molly, which does mean that Arthur did laugh. Which is, <laughs> I guess that's in his nature. He obviously loves Percy. That's actually interesting. We never hear about Percy and Arthur. 
It's always Molly and, and Percy, isn't it? But yeah, Arthur and Percy. I don't think they've really had like that much. Obviously, like actually, then again, Molly is always the one who's um, who's interacting with Fred and George as well. Actually, to be fair, so yeah, it's not just Percy. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. So yeah, he says that the that the ministry owes him a favor, and when he does, his ears go red, which I like, guys, because I was I was actually thinking a few days ago how um, how it always kept on talking about Ron's ears. In um, in uh, um, in uh, the philosopher's stone, I apologise. Um, and so it's nice to hear that coming back with it being Arthur as well, because obviously I think that Arthur is. I think that uh, Ron is possibly the the child who is most similar to Arthur. I think that that's fair to say. Um, and yes, and so oh man. Uh, da, 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 da. So yes, then we wind on till after dinner, and uh, Percy's badge has gone missing, and uh, Ron's tonic had, had, had gone missing too, which is interesting. I thought there was going to be like some big conspiracy, but it really wasn't. Ron, Ron just misplaced it, and uh, Fred and George stole the badge. Um, and then we hear Arthur and Molly arguing, and this is done completely different in the in the movie. Basically, Arthur just takes Harry aside and basically straight away just tells him the whole blurb on Sirius Black, whereas. Uh, in in typical book Harry Potter fashion, Harry overhears it, which is like ninety percent of these books is Harry overhearing things. I swear, not a criticism, but it really is the case where uh, he does a lot of eavesdropping in these books, guys. He really does. Um, and so yes, he hears basically all, all the backstory, the fact that Black is actually connected with him. Arthur wants Harry to know. Uh, so he can be on his guard and be ready and not do stupid things like go out uh, go out to the for, uh, Forbidden Forest and everything. Um, so yeah, and Arthur does want... want uh, obviously, Arthur does just give him the absolute blurb in, in the movie. Uh, Arthur remarks to Molly that there is close to... Find, finding black as they are to inventing self-spelling ones which i'm guessing is going to be something uh it's just like a common term used in the wisdom world it's like so close to you know um i guess like to, to hell freezing hell freezing over would be like a, a one example of uh of muggle language but yeah i like that i wonder if that'll come up again we'll, we'll listen that for it we'll listen that for it um very interesting that Fudge went to Azkaban the night that Black escaped. I, now, having watched the movie, I can't think of any reason why I'd think that's suspicious. Uh, but then again, you guys have told me, this book is pretty different as we go. And so, I would like to know more about Fudge visiting um, Azkaban that night. Because that does seem quite coincident coincidental, let's face it. Um, uh, apparently, uh, in his sleep, the guards have been have been saying in Azkaban that that um, that that, that uh, Sirius it keeps on saying he's at Hogwarts, he's at Hogwarts, which obviously we know what that means. But it's a good it's a good line. It's a, it's a good line, which I don't think is ever remarked upon in uh, in the movie. I, I'm pretty certain it is not, but it certainly makes you think Harry is absolutely going to be the target. Um, Dumbledore not happy about the Azkaban guards being stationed at Hogwarts, which obviously makes sense. He... I don't know if that's ever mentioned in the movie. I feel like it is the fact that Dumbledore isn't too happy about it. But obviously he does reassure all the students um, at, uh, at Hogwarts um, that uh, to not be too worried about it. Uh, so yes, uh, Harry then finds... Uh, Ron's uh, rat tonic and, and returns it to him and then bumps into Fred and George who has stolen Percy's badge. And at this point, I'm thinking, come on, give Percy a break for a second, guys. I guess it's almost a defensive thing at this point because Percy is so proud. But, you know, that's that's not a bad thing to be proud of everything. And Fred and George are really laying on thick of him. They've actually changed the badge to say, um, oh, man, what was it that... Oh, man, what was it that, that they, uh, that they uh, put on it? Big head, but big head boy. There we go. Yeah, they changed it to say big head boy. Um, 
And yeah, then we have Harry returning to his room and everything, and he says that the, you know, the thing which is at the, top, at the top of his mind at this point, he's not even that... He's not that scared. The first, It says that the thing at the top of his mind at the moment is, um, is the fact that he's not going to be able to go to Hogsmeade still. Not the fact that Black could be after him, or, or likely is after him, um... Or the fact there's going to be Azkaban Guard at Hogwarts or any of this. The main thing they're still worried about is Hogsmeade. But then again, yeah, he's a kid. That, that, that makes a lot of sense, you know. It's, very, it's obviously very, very important to him. But he now does understand why people are trying to stop him from from actually getting that freedom uh, uh, to go to Hogsmeade as well. So it does make sense. Um, he's clearly very confident. And it, like I say, he says, I don't, don't they think I can't take care of myself and that he isn't completely useless so he is really downplaying the danger of black which is very interesting considering what we learned about him in the previous chapter but it goes back to that line from ron saying what will it would we get a reward if we if we captured him so the the, the, the last two years have definitely at least for harry and ron changed them and you know built them to be a lot more confident um, and then as he goes to bed, he says out loud, I'm not going to be murdered. And the mirror replies, that's the spirit, dear. Which is amazing. <laughs> so that's it, guys. That's chapter four. Really good chapter. It's like the first chapter where, you know, the, the, we do have it kind of being represented in the movie, but incredibly briefly. So it was another joyous Diagon Alley chapter, guys. I hope that we continue to get Diagon Alley chapters because they are always a treat. But now let's get on to the very special book club. Okay, guys, so that's the Harry Potter book club. This video is going to be a bumper, but it's always going to be, though, guys, because obviously the Harry Potter book club has become such a chunky thing now, which I love. It's my favorite part of doing these videos. But also the fact that we're doing four chapters as well. And also it's the first one of the, of the series as well. And so let's get going. Thank you all so much for taking part in this. Like I say, you could be a part of it as well if you want to uh, back the Patreon for as little as you want and get, be able to get your own comments read out in here. Um, but yes, let's go through it. There are some rules, guys, but never really take um, never really take them too seriously. I say about like keep trying to keep them fairly short and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, I don't mind you're, you're bending the rules and everything. It's uh, it's all relaxed here and so let's start off with nix it says more comments loaded but this is actually the first comment so let's get on with nix uh, been looking forward to this one and the and the following books the first two films converted most of what was in the book a lot of stuff starts started being omitted from the book free onward so looking forward to watching you discover a whole lot more about harry and his world crookshanks being just one small furry but important example Ooh, very interesting because crookshanks doesn't really get that much action at all in uh, in the movie does he um not really um but uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to, to hearing more about it. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. The thing is, is I also hear that Prince of Azkaban, the movie, is beloved, though. And so it's not like the movie was like a, a, a betrayal of the book. Betrayal, I should say. Not betrayal. Betrayal of the of the book. So I'm looking forward to it as well, Nick. I'm already thoroughly enjoying it. Uh, Josh, I love the start of this book. Harry is really trying to be on his best behaviour, even with the Dursleys trying to diffuse the tension between him and Marge. Yep, absolutely. It's almost as if they're all working against Marge in a way, isn't it? In a strange way. I always got the feeling that Vernon was never overly fond of his sister. Harry getting food for from his friends to survive is s s survive the summer makes me happy also teen teenage attitude is is nice to see let's 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 you know that the series of aging is is aging with the with the reader oh i absolutely get that yes absolutely jkr w was always brilliant at that yes i mean th this is really the, the first I'd say that Harry, I'd say the characters are definitely more different between Chamber and Prisoner than they were between Stone and Chamber. So yeah, absolutely. The, the evolution is, is definitely uh, on, on its way. Vernon not being overly fond of his sister is very interesting. And we know that Petunia isn't. And we know that actually Dudley isn't as well. So yeah, maybe Vernon's a, a part of that as well. 
Um, but you know when when he he announces announces that Marge has come to stay, um, he's not like you know saying oh Bloom and Marge is staying everything like that. So well, I don't know, I, I don't know. And obviously he does like say change your bag, change your bag. But then again, he does doesn't <laughs> it doesn't mean that you're overly fond of your sister just because you don't want the, don't want that to be happening to her, you know, no matter how much she deserved it. Yeah, uh, Harry hanging out at Diagon Alley and enjoying a couple of weeks of freedom is great. So much is seeded here. Oh, I, I, I bet. I hope you enjoyed the recap. The recap chapters. This is going to be a bumpy, bumpy ride. Lol. Oh my goodness. I mean, I'm thoroughly looking forward to it. I really am. I mean, Lupin. Uh, next episode, we will definitely be meeting Lupin. I presume we must be. Um, but yes, really looking forward to a lot of aspects of of, of this uh, of this book. But yes, the Diagon Alley stuff here was awesome. But I can understand why they'd cut it out. Because like I say, movie fudge is right he, that Harry shouldn't be going out and about. Even in the Wizarding World. Anyway, thank you very much for your comment. Daniel, I'm usually not the one to gripe. I'm going to sneeze. <laughs> Daniel, I'm allergic to your comment. I apologise. I usually not want to gripe about the movies, but I just don't understand whose idea it was to have Harry use Loomis in the first scene, especially when both at the start of Chamber of Secrets and the very next scene involves Harry getting in trouble for using magic outside of school. Very interesting. That's very true. Maybe there are certain mad. I was gonna say maybe there's certain uh, spells which are allowed as long as no one else is around. Because Loomis is obviously a very low tier spell um, compared to what Dobby did um, and um, what Harry did to Marge. But yes, very interesting. Very good point, Daniel. Anyways, I love how you can see Harry's growth through his in interaction interactions with the Dursleys. In Chamber, Harry just repeats the line about being in his room and pretending he doesn't exist. But now he's starting to talk back to Vernon. Absolutely. It, it only gets sassier from here. Oh my goodness. Looking forward to the sass. Sassy Harry. Um, yes, I'm looking forward to that, definitely. Uh, but yeah, he blooming blackmails. <laughs> he really does. It's straight up. Um, I have. I have to wonder if part, uh, if part of why the the Weasleys are so poor is because they make the worst financial decisions. Spending lottery money on the trip to Egypt when it's uh, mentioned in the previous book that they re already visited Egypt last Christmas. Yes, they did. Very good point. But the kids didn't go, though, did they? Um, apart from probably Jenny. Did you see the previous book? Oh no, then Jenny wouldn't have done that. So maybe they saw it as an opportunity to have a really good treat for them. But you're right. It's not the... Financially, it's not the wisest decision. But I think you could definitely argue that as, as a, it's a, a good family decision. Thinking with your heart and, you know family spirits more than finances, which is obviously how they go, isn't it? Yeah, very interesting, Dan. You, you, you make some great points. Jake. This one was... Oh, sorry, Jake. I don't know why you said your name so aggressively then. <laughs> this one was always my favourite growing up. I loved Lupin and, as you'll probably be sick of hearing, he was done so much better in the book. Oh my goodness, Jake. I loved Lupin in the movie, so we shall see. It it wasn't until a few years ago I realised uh, Ernie Prang was a pun, though. A prang is a a prang is a British crash, apparently. Oh yeah, I no, yeah I, yeah, it's like a um, fender bender sort of thing. Prang, yeah, yeah, actually, yeah. It's not a common, maybe it's a more common term in the 90s, but it's not a common term now. 
but yes, uh, that's very interesting. I certainly didn't notice that. I just thought it was um, one of those odd wizarding names she invented. Well, the thing is, I mean, there really is a real thing where if your name is ba if your surname is Baker, you are actually scientifically and mathematically more likely to go to be a baker. And so maybe because his name was Prang, he he did just have more chance of being a bus driver. And so very skilled though, well kind of. <laughs> Apart from when he like almost crashed into a farmhouse. Thanks for the comment, Jake. Always appreciate. Um, Zeph. I'm so sorry. X is always throwing me off. I believe it's Zeph, isn't it? This is the one movie that I think actually made many improvements in, to the book. I'm curious what your thoughts will be, espe especially later in the book. This movie is also the beginning of the major omissions, though. The Leaky Cauldron chapter was almost entirely cut. It really was. Di Diagon Alley stuff, yes. And it includes some of the, my favourite bits um, of world building. More importantly, though, it includes the most important character in the book, Crookshanks. Are you being... Is that a joke? Or is Crookshanks actually the key to all this? Like, uh, like, um... What's his name? George Lucas said about Jar Jar. How Jar Jar Binks is, um... Is, is key to the prequel storyline. Bless him. Bless him. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for your, for your comments. Anna Marie. I absolutely loved Harry's week at uh, week at Diagon Alley. As a kid, uh, I, I, the idea of that much freedom at, at 13 was amazing. What do you think about the scene in the pet shop? Love to see in the pet shop. Again, it's like another list of these wonderful things. I, it's my favorite parts of these books. You're, you're right. It's just like it's like it's like a, a kid's dream, isn't it? To to have that much freedom. But th then Harry does almost immediately think, "Oh, hang on." This freedom means that I actually have to be careful with my money. So, you know, you, you know, obviously not Vernon and Petunia, but your parents or guardians would give you enough money where you can spend it but not do anything stupid financially. Well, Harry doesn't have that anymore. <laughs> he is, uh, he never had that, but uh, Harry doesn't have that here. Uh, he has all the money in, 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 that he could ever want, essentially. Uh, but he's choosing to not get the gold uh, gobs stones. And he's choosing not to even inquire about the firebolt. Which makes a lot of sense. Because uh, it's not all kids that are in the Quidditch shop. It's like, you know, grown adults are in awe of this broomstick. And so presumably it is a, 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 a rare bit of kit. Thank you very much for your comment. Mortimer. Uh, this is more comment overall. Uh, this is more comment on the overall. Oh, sorry. This is more comments to overall Harry Potter books than those four chapters, but I I will keep it very broad to not spoil anything. Much appreciated. Yeah, I know that sometimes people um, mention stuff that they that they forget about is kind of spoilery to someone who, has, who hasn't read the books. And the great thing about the, the the lovely thing about the book club guys is that if if one of the other book club members notices it, they will very very politely say, "Hey, by the way, uh, Veggie doesn't know about that yet. Can you edit your comment?" And it's, it's 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 always done very very respectfully, which I I really appreciate, guys. Seriously, it's really sweet to me. Um, I know that you have watched the movies first, so you have some idea, kind of idea, about some cha some characters. But try to read it as much as you can, like you don't know their futures. Yeah, you're right, Mortim Mortimer. Uh, sorry to keep on uh, stopping halfway for your comment. I, I did that in Chamber of Secrets, and so when, I think it was Daniel... In the comments, no, it may have been. Down, I'm sorry if it wasn't. In fact, uh, someone in the, in in the uh, in the book club said about how Percy is the number one suspect in in the book, and it just blew my mind because I just hadn't been thinking about it that way. I I didn't think for a second the fact that Percy's always there at every corner, keeping an eye on the the group and everything, making sure they're not doing anything suspicious but you know being suspicious himself as well locking himself in this room and everything and like you know Ginny walking in on him doing stuff and everything because I knew the result 
of, of the story, I didn't pick up on that at all. So you're right, I will try. I will try, Mortimer. Many characters were portrayed in the movie very differently than they are in the books. And I noticed that sometimes because of, of that, you try to justify their actions and words. There is a lot you still don't know about them, and you might think that they are better than they really are. Yep. Yeah. Ha hands up, I, I'm sure I have done that in the past. So Mortimer, I appreciate that comment. I will definitely try to... Um, I, in my head, m a lot of the characters do still look like they do in the, in, the, in the movies. You know what? Harry doesn't. Harry doesn't look like Daniel Radcliffe to me anymore. Ron and Hermione do. Snape, I try my best to, to not, because apparently he's the character which you really need to, need to uh, differentiate. Uh, McGonagall definitely doesn't look like Maggie Smith to me. Dumbledore is like a mix of the two actors to me now, at this point. Um, yeah. It's certain characters I really do associate with the movies, but I will do my... Uh, I will endeavour to get better at, at avoiding doing that. Um, Leroy! Uh, from the beginning, you, you see how Harry is becoming more... Adolescent. My dyslexia didn't stop me from getting that one. Negotiations with Vernon to sign his form. Maintaining self-control on Marge's comments for a whole week. And even when he snaps, de de decision to leave and never come back to the Dursleys. Probably ex accepting all, uh, pro possibly accepting all consequences. There will be more signs that all the characters are heading towards young adult rather than the phase of of promising of a promising child. Um, I think it makes this one and further books visibly different from than the first two. Yeah, and you know what, Leroy, Leroy, Leroy I did get that in in the movie as well. Even the bits which are different, how how Harry is being really sarcastic to Marge. Um, uh, about like the caning and everything, and also when he does what he does to, to Marge, I, I don't mean to patronise anyone who's uh, who's you know an adolescent at the moment, guys. But the way he, the way he like, goes storming up to his room and freaking kicks his, his um, I think it's like a cabinet or something like that. He like really gives it a pr proper whack. I mean that is a part of of uh, of growing up, guys. The, the the um, the sudden outbursts of aggression and everything, and not really being able to understand or control it and everything um but you're right the way that he's communicating with vernon is completely different now um and it's not like because in the first book he is like under you know, he's downtrodden by them in the second book he's enjoying the fact that he's has this power over them but here he is negotiating sure it's tantamount to blackmail um, what did I say uh, earlier? The, um, what's the term? Uh, security, oh no, what is it? What gangsters do. This video is going to be long enough as it is. Security rackets or something like, you know, it's so, so like insurance to make, to, to stop them from doing something. He... He's he's to he, stop him from doing something. He needs something back, you know. So yeah, it's it's uh, the evolution of Harry is definitely significant in this one already. It really ha it really is. Thank you so much for your wonderful comment, Michael. Uh, this is where Harry Potter really picks up the quality that continues to the end for me. The book book one and two are great, but this is such a huge step up in quality. I'm looking forward to it, Michael. I have thoroughly enjoyed these two books so far, and. You know, I'm not gonna get. I'm not gonna get my hopes too high because obviously that's that's dangerous. But all signs are saying that this is actually going to be an improvement. So looking forward to more. Thank you so much for your comments. Uh, it's a dance thing. I was always disappointed by the little bits of humour that the movies left out, like Ron calling Harry at the Dursleys, Stan Sh Sh Shanpike calling Harry Neville, even after learning his learning his real name, absolutely, and Fred and George greeting Harry as pompously as Percy. <laughs> it is amazing. That being said, the movie adaptation was very close to 
cl close in the beginning. Yeah, Marge's scene is pretty much perfect, guys. Granted, it's one scene rather than several, but what they did, it's such a well done thing. Um, and then you lose your place, Veggie. <laughs> That being said, the movie adaptation was very close at the beginning. The book just provides more context that helps answer some questions. Absolutely. Um, fun fact. I'm reading the 20th anniversary Hufflepuff edition of the books as I follow along with you. The beginning always has a little intro about Hufflepuff. And I learned that from former Minister of Magic, Dougald, Dougald Mc... <laughs> what is his name? Dougald Mc... Fail? Fail? Introduced the night bus whilst minister, and he was a Hufflepuff! So if it hadn't been for you, if it hadn't been for me, if it hadn't been for the Hufflepuffs, Harry would be, no, he wouldn't be dead, because Sirius isn't after that. <laughs> well, no, because Harry was going to fly to London with his caper, which sounds a bit dangerous. So if it hadn't been for Hufflepuff, guys, this would have been a short series of books. Just saying. Fascinating bit of information. Thank you so much, it's a dancing. Dougald McFail. I wonder if we'll hear about him, or if we've already heard about him. I reckon we probably will. Because obviously these, these books will be more about the ministry as we go. I reckon we'll hear about him. Thank you so much for that. Fascinating bit of info. Jacob. Um, starting my favourite book. Not fully sure why I like this one more than the others. Movies may have changed some things from past books, but they straight up cut things from this and future books. Looking forward to your reaction to new information you will get. This is, this is something which you guys keep on saying, guys, and it fascinates me, because obviously we have had things, big things being omitted from the movies. Valentine's Day, uh, Sir Nicholas's death day, but you might be talking about important things, though, because those, those are side quests. I'm, I'm using the term side quests a lot at the moment, guys. In, in Buffy, uh, in my Buffy series, whenever it's an episode that isn't involving the main story arc, I call them side quests. <laughs> Did a really good good side quest a couple of, a couple of uh, weeks ago. What was it called? Uh, Some Assembly Needed. That one got me, guys. That was a good episode. And it's not overly beloved by, by the fan base from what I gather, but I thought it was wonderful. Anyway, and we just met Spike as well, if, if, if you're interested in checking out the Buffy series. Um, Caddy. I agree that... Har I don't know why I'm saying all the names so aggressively today. I'm sorry, Caddy. I agree with Harry. She deserved what she got. What a despicable hypocrite calling someone a drunk. What she's... She's obviously a, 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 a lush herself. Katty, I didn't even notice that. How the heck did I not notice that? Such a good point. She's completely tanked up. There's lots of terms for being drunk in the UK, UK guys. Seriously, like, you basically say anything. She's she's uh, squash racketed. You can say anything and, and you'll understand what you mean. I don't know why I said squash racket. Uh, anyway. I never noticed that. Not to mention the poor puppy that she um, disposed of because it was a rant. I know, Kay, that really. And the thing is, it's a it's a fictional book, but it still upsets me here. Just hearing about the fact that anyone would do that sort of thing, it's it's beyond me. It really, I cannot understand it. That's why when I got Woozle and found out about the state that she'd been left in and her condition, I did mention it earlier, but her, her ear was very badly bleeding as well. Um, I don't understand how people could do that to a dog. Don't get emotional, Veggie. I love dogs. I'm sorry, guys. And I love my Woozle. And she's in a really good mood today. She's got a jumper on because it's really cold in the UK. And so she has this lovely purple jumper that she wears around like a polo neck. She really likes it. When I get when I get it out for, to put on her, her tail starts whacking. <laughs> so, yes, I'm sorry about getting emotional, guys. But, yes. Um, thank you so much, Catty, for your wonderful comment. Benjamin. Well, if... Uh, you thought Vernon and Petrina were bad. Just remember, there's always someone who is worse. Going back to the Star Wars reference, there's always a bigger fish. <laughs> it's a prequel again. Uh, there's always a bigger fish. What a stupid line. <laughs> anyway, in Star Wars... Sorry, guys. Not to rant on the, on the prequels. I'm, I'm sure they're better than I remember them, in fact. I bet they are. And I, I, I enjoyed... Um, 
Revenge of the Sith. Was that what it's called? There were definitely bits that could have been done a lot better. But I did enjoy uh, Revenge of the Sith. Um, my brother absolutely despises everything about the prequels. <laughs> Even Duel of the Fate, which I think is... I think that when I say, well, what about Duel of the Fate? Which is the ha-ha-ha-ha tune uh, from, from uh, the prequels. Um, which, uh, whenever he says that he doesn't like anything about the prequels, I say, oh, what about Duel of the Fate? And I do feel like he... He, he's like, yeah, I don't like that either. <laughs> I think he probably does like it, because it's freaking amazing. It's one of the best action tunes going in movies, in my opinion. <laughs> anyway, what's your favourite thing about the prequels? Star Wars prequels. What else do I like about the prequels? Sebulba I liked. I thought he was cool. Um, Yeah, I like Sebulba. He was cool. I don't think he was meant to be any particular stereotype because there are several stereotypes in the prequels, guys, which I didn't even pick, pick up on when I first watched them. Um, what else? Uh, order... Si mm. I can't really say that. Can I? I? I guess I can. Order 66, I thought, was good. It could have been done better. Yeah, there are good things about him. But, you know, you shouldn't have to tr try and search for good things from a movie. You should just like the movie, you know? And it quite... Yeah, anyway. We're not talking about Star Wars. Sorry, Benjamin! I completely sidetracked your, your, your comment. Um, <laughs> also, it's so, so funny to see how wizards have no clue about technology. Ron Focal was hilarious. Imagine introducing them to the internet. Oh, my goodness! That would take a while. Um... When the box is like going, doo, 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 the modem, I should say. Back in the 90s, that's what internet did. You had to listen to this weird tune before you could actually get on the internet. Wonder if, if Ron would start to try and talk with it, maybe? That's an amazing point, Benjamin. Um, Catherine. Actually, quite frankly, the internet would be super useful to wisdom folk as well. They would they would use it. They would absolutely use use the, uh, the World Wide Web. Um, Catherine. Just wanted to say thank you for these book reviews and, and the book club. I didn't skip a com comment then. I didn't. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Catherine. I just want to say thank you for these book reviews and, and book club. It's a, it's a delight to reread the books again. I have not read them since they were published. Oh my goodness, Catherine. It's nice to go back and and make and make to do... Do I... Oh, and mate, do I wish that phone call w was in there. Too funny. This... I mean, you know what, Catherine? At the end, when, when we're getting towards the end of the book, I will um, do another poll and say which scene would you have liked to have been in the movie the most. Diagon Alley will definitely be in there. Or, yeah, Diagon Alley would be, more, would be in there. A more book accurate night bus, but quite frankly, I think the night bus scene in the movie is so bloomin' charming, I don't think that would win. Um, Ron's phone call will be on there because that just keeps on getting brought up. Yeah. We, 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 uh, we, we'll definitely do it. But yeah, that seems, that there seems to be a highly voted for one so far to it. Thank you so much for your comments. Rebecca, I love, I really love reading these books again and rediscovering all the little details I'd forgotten or, or never noticed the first place. For example, the Invisible Book of Invisibility. <laughs> so stupid. It's so it's so stupid. Has got to be one of the funniest things I've ever read. And from my own experience working with the, uh, working with the general public, I know there would be some people silly enough to actually want to buy them. Oh, absolutely, definitely, Rebecca. I absolutely agree. Uh, I remember that there, were, there was like um, a toy that you used to be able to get. You know when action figures like like Star Wars again, going back to Star Wars again. You'd have like the action figure with like a, a it'd be like a cardboard backing with like a plastic shell over the action figure, and there was one for like an invis invisibility man or something like that, and it was just an empty packet. People will buy this stuff. <laughs> uh, so you're absolutely right, Rebecca. I always uh, I all. Also only noticed this time around that Sirius's hair is described as elbow length. Oh, I didn't even notice it. Okay. In in this book, or maybe it's because he's been at Azkaban for a while, but then again, they take his picture when going in, not not whilst he's been there. So yeah, that would have been what he looked like go, going going in. Um, 
Wow, that would have been a look. I'm sure Gary Oldman could have pulled it off though. Uh, <laughs> if they'd kept that in the in the film. Sort of uh, glad they made it a bit shorter, to be honest. Oh, Sirius looks so cool. He always does, actually, in all the movies that he's in. He always looks really awesome. I say all of them. He's only technically in three, isn't he? Azkaban. He's not in... No, he is in Goblet. He is in Goblet. Okay, hush my mouth. He's in... He's in... He's in the feed. Um... That... Let's not... Okay. It'll be interesting to see how that's done in the book. That's what, what I'm trying to get. I need to stop getting sidetracked. So... Speaking of which... The, that mirror that Harry has in, in the Leaky Cauldron. I mean, most wiz Wizarding World sounds like a wonderful place to be. But the last thing you need is a, is a judgmental mirror when I, I, I was rushing out the door in the morning. Yikes. I know, Rebecca, that's what I was saying. Because the thing is, that, that mirror's behaviour is going to affect how people will rate the Leaky Cauldron. You give them a out of five... I can't remember what it's called, but you know, the... the, the uh, TripAdvisor thing, you know, you know what I mean? And so, um... Oh, the Wizarding TripAdvisor. Um, has an owl. Their logo is an owl. It all makes sense. Conspiracy music, Reggie Knights. Anyway, um, I'm not making any blooming sense. I'm sorry. Right, so, yes, you're right. I completely agree, Re Rebecca. But it's uh, it's always polite to Harry. And, it, and it's not wrong about the hair. Yeah. But yeah, you definitely don't need a judgmental mirror first thing in the morning, that's for sure. Uh, Saltair. Saltair, you have an uh, you have an R5-D4 icon. A uh, uh, droid in your icon. Should we just abandon this and start doing a Star Wars book club, guys? Because <laughs> this is ridiculous. I'm obsessed today, I'm obsessed. But yes, that looks like an R5-D4. It's definitely an R5 unit, which um, in A New Hope, they refer to as an R2 unit, which is incorrect. R5-D4 uh, is the little droid that blows up um, next to the sound crawler, which means that R2-D2 is, is bought by um, uh, Luke's um, uncle instead. But they refer to it as an R2 unit. It's not an R2 unit, it's an R5 unit. They don't even know they're droids. Harry Potter, veggie! May the force be with you. I've got anything Star Wars related here. I don't. Oh, hang on, I must do. Uh, yes, yes, I do, but I'm not going to get it now. I've got loads of video games. Right. right. Back to the comments. I'm so sorry. Did I even read your comment? I didn't! I'm sorry, Saltier. Right. Just wanted to say how, something general. The opening chapter of the book and the daily events in Hogwarts are my favourite things in, in this world. Sure, Voldemort and his f f followers... Follower's story are excellent, but I'm always more interested in learning little things about the world than when the main story kicks in. I know exactly what you mean, Saltier, and I'll give you an example. I remember, I think I even said this in my uh, Philosopher's Stone um, book review. I think I say that my favourite character from that book is Hogwarts. All its little kinks and its like little... Um, Quips, not quips, but you know, interesting th details about it. Um, so yeah, I, I agree. The, the world be building is is such a great thing in this series, and that's why I love it. Where like Harry like looks at a shelf of books, and he and he like notes notices what they're all called and what who they're all written by and everything. It adds so much to the universe. It's wonderful. It's an absolute treat every single time it happens. <laughs> Thank you very much for your comment, and I'm sorry for talking about your icon. Uh, Jacqueline. Uh, Marge is... Uh, oh, I thought you swore then. <laughs> Marge is just the absolute worst, isn't she? I get why they had to shorten her visits from from, from a week to just uh, the night. But man, Harry seem, seeming to have at least a little bit of fun putting, putting on the act, at least. Yes, absolutely. It was the right decision. It's the start of the movie. You can't have very long sequences it makes a lot of sense um i love the the getting more of the night bus as well it's so different isn't it also hermione gets crookshanks after he he sculpts ron is just chef's kiss <laughs> and it's a ginger cat as well noting that down great comment jacqueline much appreciated georgia 
I'm so sorry if I was saying these name wrong, names wrong, guys. Um, this is the first book where I feel like I'm not waiting to get back to Hogwarts. Oh, maybe that's just the effect of the Dursleys free, free, uh, it being Dursley free uh, more quickly. That's literally how Harry refers to it, isn't it? To Durs Dursley free weeks. <laughs> This book is also the first where you you can feel the world expanding and becoming a system that is complex and works working away when Harry isn't there. I, I agree. Like the whole Egypt thing and France and, uh, and everything. Um, down to Harry considering what he would do if he couldn't be a, a wizard anymore. His time at the Leaky Cauldron feels like a breath of fresh air for Harry and the reader with a little detail sp sprinkled in about Crookshanks, Scabbers, etc. For, for later. Interesting. I also just love Harry get, going to get ice cream uh, at Florin... Oh my goodness, you, 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 I mean, I'm guessing this is the correct spelling. Uh, Fortigrew, I think is how I uh, typed out. I hope that... Fortigrew. Fortisque. Ah, okay. You, you've definitely got it right here. Uh, helped him with, with his with his schoolwork. It's so so wholesome. Also, it's so interesting to see how Fudge handles this instance uh, of underage magic completely differently from how he does in Order. Oh, very in interesting point. Shows how flaky he is as a, a leader when it suits him. Absolutely, yeah. And it's very different in the movie as well. How. Um, how he's the one who brings up the fact that there's a killer on the loose and everything like that. Definitely he's holding his cards closer to his chest in the in the book. And like you say, uh, being um, inconsistent with his um, with his philosophies on magic. Great comment, greatly appreciated. Cat. Uh, you may have already clocked this, but Ron gives Harry a, a, a Sneakoscope for his birthday. He tells Harry it keeps going off at the Weasley's dinner table and says this is because Fred and George put beetles in the soup. But I think this is actually because Scabbers is Peter Pettigrew was all is all along. Oh, cat! Great point. Look, that's a very good point. Look, look, look out for more scenes. The heck's up in there? Sorry, cats. Right. Um, look out for more scenes with it in the coming chapters, as I think they make my theory more plausible. Very interesting. P.S. I always thought the Weasleys could have spent the money they want on something more practical than a holiday, as they are so poor. Am I just a grump? Haha. <laughs> yeah, cats. Yeah. This is going back to the er earlier comment as well. You know what? I didn't see it like that. I actually didn't. But you are right. It's it's it is irresponsible financially. It's very important to, to say that word. It is financially irresponsible. But a family holiday when your family is that big, where you're all there, is also incredibly important as well. So um, I say that I I, I I don't know. That's how I interpreted it. But you're right. And also Ron's wand as well, they got. Yeah. Made for a nice photo, though. Yeah, it's, it's a great point. Uh, thank you very much, Gad. Uh, Christina. It's always kind of strange how people only get excited or sus suspicious when they notice that Harry has a scar. He's been, been part of the Wizarding World for two years now. I can't imagine no... No one ever took a picture of him and published it so everyone would recognize him instantly by now. Very interesting point, particularly with Lockhart around as well. I was going to say Rita Skeeter, but of course we haven't met Rita Skeeter yet, have we? Maybe there are rules around... <clears throat> it would have only been at Hogwarts where they would have had a chance to take a picture of Harry. Obviously, Colin's doing that. But I would not imagine that Dumbledore would be very happy with the press coming to Hogwarts, particularly during Chamber 
Oh my goodness, imagine if the press were there then. Um, very good point, Christine. I'm just trying to trying to log see trying to see if there is a reason why why he wouldn't have had a picture of him yet. I did think the same thing though when Stan was was talking to him though, and he was talking about and he's like, like how do you not know about Sirius Black? Was talking about talking to the boy who lived. Um published anywhere would recognize him instantly by now actually i think he appeared in the daily prophet with lockhart at the start of the second year so why wouldn't the guy on the night bus who clearly loves gossip immediately say something like that holy cricket your harry potter very british term there um they do it's the Daily Prophet that have set up the the book signing in a flourishing plots, isn't it? I think. I think they're involved. And and Lockhart forced Harry to have all his books and pose with a picture with them, so. And it's not like Harry's hair's changed, because his hair can't change. <laughs> oh man, Christina, good point, good point. Slimmer, <laughs> just go with slim. Thank you, slim. Uh, the idea of Ron and Vernon yelling at each other down the phone is um, is always tickles me. This is like such an such a popular moment for this book. Most the movie is pretty good. One thing they do fail at is selling Black as a real dangerous threat to Harry. Black is mad and murdered thirteen people with a single curse. It's just a lot more impressive than Black and Voldemort were chums back in the day. Similarly, we hear a, an awful lot about Azkaban and the guards before Harry even interacts with them. Yes, well, absolutely, we're hearing about the guards a lot. I'll say this, Arthur, um, the guy, um, Arthur's actor in, in, in the movies, that scene where they're all, you know, Ron showing in the picture of Egypt and all the families going around and uh, Fred and George are making jokes and everything. Ginny's there. Um, Percy's getting the tea. Molly's coming over to Harry, make sure that he, he's, he's got all his stuff ready for the school and he's got all his robes and everything, making sure being very, very lovely. And then suddenly Arthur takes him away and all instantly the scene changes. Um, I like that. I feel like that moment really puts him over. Uh, black, I should say, as being, okay, now we need to talk business because you're actually in danger. The way that scene is done, and it's almost, it, it, it's, I mean, it's two shots because it has Ron and Harry, Ron showing Harry the picture. And then it goes to this wonderful one shot of all these people coming in and like, you know, someone like making a snake coming out of a basket and all sorts of things going on in the background. Tom's uh, behind the bar reading a paper with someone. Um, and you have this lovely family moment for Harry. And then suddenly... The audio get almost there's like all this bus hustle and bustle, and it's almost as if the audio gets quieted down as soon as Arthur starts talk talking to Harry in private about Black. So that moment I thought was what actually put Black over quite well. Um, but that being said, I mean what you're saying here is is the stand stuff where in the movie he's like he's a murderer, and it's almost as if Har Stan's trying to freak Harry out a bit, which is certainly not what he's trying to do in the book. Uh, but yes, he, he mentions the fact that 13 people were killed with a single curse. And the fact that uh, the Black was just left laughing. You're right. The, the book definitely did do a better job of putting him over. That being said, the poster that is in, uh, in uh, the movie is definitely creepy. I wonder if you could buy that. Because you can you can have like like animated photos now, can't you? Like you know, obviously it's a video technically playing, but I wonder if you could get like a poster and it's actually a video of that playing. That'd be cool. No, oh, that'd be very cool. But yeah, that poster it's Gary Oldman. His performance in that poster is very very creepy. But yeah, you're right. The the book does do a better job at putting him putting him over, as as the as wrestling would say. Uh, H. Uh, I like how much you can feel the panic from Harry as Harry runs away. I also find it kind of interesting that Sirius was just there just before the night bus arrived since that's the a moment that he can probably relate to since he ran away from his own parents. 
That's so true, H. Did he? Yes, because he stayed with the Potters, didn't he? Yeah. I want to see that prequel, guys. So true, H. And this is going back to Harry relating to uh, Tom Riddle as well. There's all these relation, all these relatable moments. With you know, the orphanage, what Marge was saying. And then Sirius seeing Harry in the same situation. I do wonder what Sirius's plan was that night. Maybe, maybe we'll get into it. Maybe, it's, maybe it's explained in the movie, and I, and I can't remember. But you know, we shall see. We shall see. Um, I'm sure it will get explained. Great point, though, H. It's also nice to see Harry standing up for himself in in different ways. First, by making a deal with one of his uh, uh, abusers by threatening to tell Marge everything, and then a bit more uncontrolled when, well, you know, <laughs> absolutely, and then. Questioning Fudge because he has nothing noted a, a a change there. Yes, absolutely. He he he's absolutely calling Fudge out. The marching was an accident, though, wasn't it? In the movie, it's definitely an accident because Harry's like, "What the heck's going on?" But uh, but maybe it wasn't. And obviously, Fudge refers to it as an accident, but you know he's covering Harry's tracks, though, isn't he? Um, as you of course already know from the films questioning the official story and standing up for the truth is an important part of this book uh, i'd say even though that part of the story gets more important in the later books order the phoenix as an obvious example as you already know from the film absolutely um Reading about scabbers in these chapters is quite amusing when you know the full story. Well, yeah, missing the toe and everything. Yeah, absolutely, H. Fantastic comment. Great, great, greatly put. Annette. Um, to me, the biggest difference in the book is this: is the scene of... Sorry, the sense of time. You realize, really realise that Harry has had to put up with Marge's snipes at, uh, at him the entire week. He handles it admirably until he went after his his parents, especially the remark about his mother. I swear that that, that remark about the mother was was like the third night rather than the last night. But I, I know what you mean, though. He obviously then goes back onto she goes on back on about her in the last night as well. Also, <coughs> the weeks of freedom he has a diagon alley for for weeks before leaving for school. Uh, missing fr from the movie they absolutely are yeah you know what it does the whole fact that the whole week long thing with marge also puts over how much going to hogsmeade would have meant to harry that's really what it's putting over the most in fact because uh, in the movie you don't really get that you know um the, ne the next time we hear about the, the permission letter i'm pretty sure is literally as mcgongle saying that he, like, he can't go then there's a mention of sirius on the television and the conversation between Stan and Ernie on the night bus. I also really like the better description of how the Dementors affect uh, everyone, but especially all the kids on uh, on the train compartment. Oh, this is going into future stuff. Oh, yeah, uh, uh, this is going into what we'll be covering next time. Thank you so much for for your for your comments, and I will leave it there. If that's okay. <laughs> uh, much much appreciated though, uh, Johnny. I really admire Harry for putting up with Aunt Marge for a whole week. She was truly horrible. Even the Dursleys look like a, a loving family in comparison to her. They actually do. That's the scary thing. In comparison. He really wants the permission to visit Hogsmeade so badly. This is exactly what I was just saying. <laughs> Even in the last chapter, you could... You could uh, last Later chapters, you can see it. First, he asks Fudge to sign it. Then he... he, he his thoughts after finding it out Sirius was after him were about his own safety, but about not, oh sorry, not about his own safety, but were about his ability to go to Hogsmeade. Absolutely. I think it describes the priorities of a 13 year old boy quite accurately. Perfectly put, Janny, Janny, very well put. I completely agree. Caddix. I love that there uh, is implied magic magical tour tourism I I industry 
I mean, I mean, Weasleys go on holiday to Egypt, buy s s sneaker scopes in the souvenir shop. Magical ones? Magical one? Go visit the tombs, and the way Ron describes it, wizards get a different guided tour to, to us muggles. Well, yeah, absolutely. Like I say, I think that there are tours that only Egyptians, that Egyptians are allowed to go on as well. I think that's right. If, if you're Egyptian and I've got that wrong, please correct me. Um, then Hermione goes on a holiday with her muggle parents, yet she learns a lot about local magic, magical history. She does... She Did she just visit a local magical visitor center? I presume that there are areas like Hogwarts and Hogsmeade that are going to be in every other country. So there's going to be areas where muggles just don't go. And so you'd imagine that in these mag in these touristy areas, tourist traps, they would be, wouldn't they? Magical tourist traps. They would have muggle information about what's going on in the other areas. But yeah. There would absolutely be magical vis magical visitor centers. There probably would be in the middle of any city, in fact. Yeah, there would be. Very interesting point, Katek. And this is why it's so nice to hear about this stuff so early on, you know. About the wider world. I gotta say, guys, if I were to visit anywhere tourist-wise in the world, I feel like... I feel like Egypt would be up there. Cairo, the, the pyramids, you know. I, I've always just find them fascinating. I really have. Um, let me know where you'd, where you'd visit. Uh, Gary. <laughs> I love this book. And all the books. But there is one thing that, that really bothers me about the, these chapters. Again and again, everyone calls the Dementors the Azkaban Guards. Then, and then as soon as Harry learns what a Dementor is, they never called that again oh it's just so seems terribly convenient interesting gary that is interesting unless unless it's a secret what the azkaban guards are so it's not widely known that they are dementors they're just known to be very good guards and so People like Arthur would always refer to them as Azkaban guards. Unless you're saying that later on in the book, Arthur then starts to refer to them as, as uh, Dementors. It's going to be interesting to hear what Dumbledore says. I'll keep an eye on that, Gary, because that's very interesting. I wonder if it's because the general wizarding world public don't actually know that Dementors are actually employed by uh, Azkaban. But obviously, them being sent over to Hogwarts is kind of going to expose that, isn't it? So... Yeah, I will keep an eye on that. Um, also, I'm surprised that no one else has mentioned it, but there is no mention of weird floating the weird floating head that they added to, 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 into the movie on the night bus. What was that about? You know what, Gary? When I watch that scene, um, when I watch that scene, it gives me weird memories of the first time first time I, I went to, to to London without my parents you know like yeah, that the whole feeling of everything is kind of almost alien and strange you know and the shrunken head is one of the aspects of that scene which does that the most for me the first the fact that it's something really unnerving and odd and to anyone who's Harry's age is going to be quite a trip you know what I mean Obviously, we then have the shrunken heads later on in Hogsmeade, don't we? Uh, so we'll see if that comes back in, in, in the book. But yeah, I think it's a great addition. Maybe it was the people making the movie th trying to find Lenny Henry a role in it. Because uh, he's perfect for, for it, quite frankly. But um, I thought it was a great addition. I, you know what? If, you, if anyone disagrees with me, let me know in the comments, please. I'd, I'd love to hear that. Uh, said El Sayed. Um, I love the small att attention to detail added in the book by the art author. It really brings the wisdom world into life. Like when Harry mentions his essay and what he is, he has read 
in, in the books. It's crazy to me how a fictional world could be so detailed. Loving all your reviews and look forward to the rest of the series. Yes, yeah, said it's very interesting. You know what? Because I... I, I <clears throat> because, yeah. When I first started to learn about this world, I was... I, I do often th think to myself, okay, so wizards are real. Does that mean that Gandalf was real? Turns out, yes, Gandalf was real and he was a slivering. Uh, w were were real witches hunted down during the, the Middle Ages? Not many of them, but whenever they act, they coincidentally did find a witch, didn't bother the witches at all. So yeah, it's it's little questions. One thing which I would I don't think that the books are going to go to because it'd be too much of a controversial subject. But one thing which I would like to know is what does that mean about religion? But, like I say, that would be too controversial a subject. I don't think that it's going to go into which religion is correct or which religion is accurate and all this sort of stuff, you know? I, I don't think I don't think that's going to come up at any point during the books. But, it, yeah, the fact that the wizards are straight up real and they always have been real, what does that, that, what does that, what does that mean for history? The Bermuda, the Bermuda Triangle is something that we haven't heard about yet, I don't think. I, 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 you know what, I'm going to put a prediction out there. What, how's my hat doing that? Weird. Um, I'm going to put a prediction out here right now. Unless it's already happened, and if it has, correct me. I reckon that we'll hear about the Blue Bermuda Triangle being something to do with wizard, the wizarding world at some point. Thank you so much for, for your comment. Love all your... Oh, I didn't finish it, did I? Here he is. Harry mentions essay. Loving all your reviews and looking forward to the rest of the series. Thank you so much, sir. Very kind of you. Uh, Frederick. The night bus is a very di is very different in the books, and I can't wait to hear your thoughts on 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 this episode. Personally, it's the Hogsmeade's permission slip saga that caught my attention. First, how Harry tries to leverage good behavior with Marge uh, for Uncle Vernon's signature. He's not that f forceful in the film. No, he doesn't even tell. He just basically says, "Oh, can you just sign this?" He's just trying to get Vernon to, blah, blah, blah. you know. But but um. It's so far away, the fact that, I, because it's so far away, I didn't even realise it was there until I, I, I uh, checked out the chapters, so. Um, and then how qu quickly he realises that it will never be signed once he learns that everyone is worried about him because of Sirius Back being after him. He doesn't catch on nearly as quickly in the movie. It takes overhearing the adults talk in Hogsmeade for Harry to put two and two together. Oh yeah, yeah. That makes yeah. That is pro that is the first time, isn't it? Um, it's. I it, it, the thing is, is that the permission slip is something that we all would have gone through at school as well, at least in the UK, and so it, it's bringing that real life relatability to it. Yeah. Uh, Book Harry is shown to be so clever. He is he is in the movies too, but you're meant to assume he is instead of being shown it. Yeah, well, that's the difference between a, a movie and a book, though, isn't it? The, the fact that we hear Harry's internal dialogue. I mean, most of the stuff about the permission stop slip is internal dialogue. Um, although, you know, maybe they could have thrown in a line where, when, when he's uh, in the leaky cauldron with Ron and, and Hammond just said, yeah, I've wasn't able to get my uh, my guardians to sign this, and for him to like, yeah, it's it's really something which is just like, um, it's a very background thing, um, and in the book, it really is. It's the thing the most on Harry's mind at this point. It's kind of crazy considering everything that he's just learned. Uh, thank you so much for your wonderful comments, uh, Digo. Uh, something that was pointed out to me in another podcast. You've been listening to other podcasts? I sh oh, man, I keep thinking... I, I, I need to put these out as podcasts eventually, guys. I really do. I'm sorry to, to everyone who's been asking me to do that. Wizard Team. Uh, let me know if you, you also listen to Wizard Team, guys. That sounds like a good good a title for a, for a podcast. Uh, a while ago. I was only joking about listening to other podcasts. Just now, guys. I just want to make sure that, you know, that, you know, that, that is obvious. Um, the homework assignment states that witches... Uh, bur bur burning is which burning is pointless now while that might be true physically speaking since the true witches weren't hurt by it it along 
it along with other things that happened during the witch hunt does seem to have had a lasting effect on wizard society itself since it drove them into hiding st st status of sec status or oh, status of secrecy i think it's just a nice little detail whether completely intentional or not by rollings rolling i always guess i always say rollings um that shows how wizards tend to look down on muggles tend to not actually acknowledge their accomplishments and will sometimes rewrite history if it suits them not that we muggles would be better at it at that well that's very true um so the only thing that we really know about muggle studies from the movies is that the the muggle study teacher is very pro muggle obviously arthur is a very pro muggle as well there has to be a grey area as well, though, guys. It's not you're either that teacher or Arthur Weasley or Voldemort, you know? There has to be a grey area. And so in Muggle Studies, when it isn't being run by that particular teacher, would, say, another teacher who's not that fond of Muggles bring up the witch hunting? What, what lesson is he writing that paper for? Or is it his, um, his uh, form group, maybe? Oh, it knows history of magic, isn't it? It is. It is because Hermione says about how she's done more length than what um, the history of magic teacher. Oh no, I can't remember his bloody name. History of magic teacher um, wanted. So yeah, it is history of magic. So yeah, which is interesting that you talk about muggles in history of magic. Hmm. History of. It's a short name, isn't it? Mr. Oh, come on. Oh, come on. Bins. Bins. There we go. Bins means heights. Sharp. Right. Um, where was I? Da, 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 da. On a lighter note, gotta love the relief of the bookshop assistant when he learned how he doesn't need a, a copy of the Monster of the Books of Monsters. I, it was on my notes. I, I, I think I skipped a note. I think I skipped a note because there's one bit where um, Ron, when Ron and Hermione are talking with Harry, they say that the uh, that the shop owner he started crying. I think I must have missed some notes, guys. I swear I put that down in my notes. Ron and Hermione told you, well, Cookshanks. Yeah, no, maybe I didn't put it down. But yeah, Ron says about how the, 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 the bookstore owner almost started crying when Ron and Hermione went in there to get their monster book of monsters, which is amazing. Jonas, who was responsible for these wonderful sitars. We've even got a book club one as well. First of all, a little rant. Uh oh, it's not about me, is it? Why the F is Harry using magic at the Dursleys in the first scene of the movie? This is what the person was saying as well. I mean, even without the detail from the book, just with the knowledge of the movies isn't this isn't making this wouldn't make sense i never got why they changed that in the night bus chapter we've met one of my favorite side characters stan shunpike i think he's absolutely hilarious he is and he's great in the movie as well he's very well cast in the movie how he keeps calling Harry Neville, even though he, he knows who he is, it's amazing. Um, and I love the last chapter. So many little details in the story. How Hermione originally wanted an owl so she could send mail herself and instead gets Crookshanks is, is awesome. I know, like I say, I reckon the shopkeeper knew what she was doing. <laughs> I, I really do. Regarding the magic thing, I will say it again. I do think that maybe there are levels of magic where it's like... Are we really going to send a note just because someone used Luma, Lunas, Lumus? But you're right though. You're not meant to be doing magic on purpose. And he is absolute straight up doing magic on purpose. I guess it's just the mischievousness. It's a very mischievous scene. It's, it's actually really... It's charming. I think... This, I, 
I, I don't know if you book readers who read the books first hate that scene. I'm sure you probably don't. But as someone who saw that in the first um, first time experiencing this story, it's one of the first times where we see a really mischievous Harry. And the fact that he's laughing his head off whilst he's pretending to be asleep. So from a scene standpoint, I thought it was charming when first hearing it. But uh, but yeah, you're right. It is, it is a loophole that doesn't make much sense. Plot hole. Um, plot a hole. Right, sorry. Um, I think you can already kind of see why most people, I think, say this is where the, it starts to get really, really good. Uh, because the book takes its time to talk about things that are not necessarily incredibly important to the plot. I think this gives the story a lot of depth. It's, it's the permission slip, isn't it? That's the ultimate example of this so far. Hope you are doing well, Veggie. Can't wait to see close tag on this one. Oh, I haven't done that yet. Oh, my goodness. Okay. Uh, yes, uh, Jonas always keeps lying on the uh, book club to see when it's been closed. I will close it as soon as I, I finish recording. Uh, Dara. So excited. Can't wait for the later chapters. Say no more. We will be getting there. Ah, Nick deleted. So I think this may have been one of the ones where uh, something was said that, that that shouldn't have been. And it was very, very politely done. The good the good thing is, guys, that whenever I get an email uh, that someone's commented on, on Patreon, when, when it works, um, it won't say where it is. And so I'll click on the email. And if it looks like it's going to be in one of the Harry Potter book clubs, I then stop reading it. But then because, because that's the way it, it worked, I then did start to see a couple of comments saying, oh, by the way, I, Veggie doesn't know that yet. And so I saw those, and so I knew that there was something going on. Uh, but it was very politely sold. And so, Nick, thank you very much for your comments. Um, hope to see you next time. Maybe you're even further down on the list. But thank you very much for, for, for taking part, and hope to see you the next time. Uh, Tammy. This book club has been going for over an hour. <laughs> While rereading these chapters, I notice again how clever Harry actually is. I mean, when he left the Dursleys, he made a whole plan about how he would escape the ministry and live uh, as an outcast, which was completely left out of the movie. Absolutely. And uh, he, that is clever, but it's also the panic that's he sh sh that, 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 and, and the realization that he may have just thrown everything away. That's just like rushing through his head. Um, but you know, you can't, how can you, how could, how could you do that in the movie though? Maybe he'd be talking to himself whilst walking down the street, could work. Uh, then he noticed immediately that something was off when Fudge was the one who, one waiting for him at the leaky cauldron. And when he didn't get punished for blowing up his aunt. I love the way you guys put that. <laughs> he, he, he immediately put all the pieces together, uh, after overhearing the Weasley's parents talking about Sirius, who is, by the way, my favourite character from this book. Looking forward to that. I'm, I'm really looking forward to Lupin. I'm really looking forward to Lupin, but Sirius as well. Uh, also, love the fact that Harry asked the Ministry of Magic to sign his Hog Hogsmeade form. That is very clever. I, in that situation, I wouldn't fall that for a second. Quite frankly, I would have just been happy getting out of that, uh, getting out of that conversation with Fudge. But yes, that is so smart. You're right. It is really showing how smart Harry is. And cunning, in a way, you know? Only four chapters in, and we already have a lot of amazing things left out of the movie that I really enjoyed. Like Harry getting pre presents from his pe from his friends. More information about the monster... Uh, 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 yeah, monster book of mo monsters. Absolutely. Uh, that's just like one scene, or two scenes later on as well, um, in, in the movie. Uh, the early mention of, Gr of Grimm on the cover of a divination book. Oh, very interesting. And Scabbers, uh, Pettigrew looking ill. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, it, again, you can't start a movie with s s slowness, you know? And I think that uh, Prince of Azkaban may be the ultimate example of we need to keep people interested until we get to Hogwarts and then we can breathe out and now... We're, we're into the movie, you know, but it's like the comment earlier on saying that um, that with the other books, they're always waiting for them to get to Hogwarts. That's where the real meat of the uh, meat of the story starts. Not really Regan. Um, and so, yeah, in the movie, they're probably worried that if we hold off Hogwarts too long, 
people are start going, interesting going to start slipping. So maybe that's why it did it. But it was a treat experiencing the book like this. So thank you so much for, for your comment. How are? I can, I can already see this is going to be a super long video. Oh my goodness, it really is. But I'll, bold of you to review four chapters at once, since from now on the books really start to differ from the movie, or to be more precise, from now on the filmmakers start to leave out a lot of stuff from the book. There seems to be a lot, a lot of you guys are saying. I should say, guys, I think it's just going to be this one, which is four, episodes, four, four chapters. And then we'll be back to free next time. I know that you guys say later on that I should really up that. Um, but I also really like going into this amount of detail. So I know, I know guys, it's going to take a, a long time to get through everything. Especially at my current pace. But I do hope for that pace to change um, when, when it can. Um, I actually think you might consider reviewing just two chapters per, per video. Beginning with... Uh, with um, Prisoner of Azkaban, not only do the books get longer, darker, more mature, they also get much more controversial, and most of the controversial stuff was left out of the movies as well. Oh, very interesting. Looking forward to finding out what that is. Two chapters per video. If I'd done the first two chapters of Prisoner of Azkaban, very little would have happened. Oh, no, that's not true. No, yeah. I'm, tr I'm trying to find a good balance for it, Hoa. So I hope hope that the way that we're currently doing it isn't too um, disappointing. I don't think it is. But uh, any feedback on this sort of thing, guys, do do let me know. Because I'm, I'm trying to get the right, the, the perfect mix. Uh, the Dursleys did their best and to denigrate Harry's parents. But Uncle Vernon actually told Marge the truth one time. James Potter was indeed unemployed. However, he I thought he, they were... Um, they, they, I can't remember what it was that they did. However, he didn't live off government money. He inherited some gold from his parents that he didn't have to, to work. Oh, really? Um, wasn't a drunk and obviously didn't die in a car crash. Interesting fact. A lot of the fan fiction, James works um, as an Aurea. I think that I feel like I, I feel like that's what, what I had heard. It's such a common trope that many fans actually think this was this was the case in the in the books as well. But no, he wasn't even old enough to be a qualified Aurea. Uh, remember, the Potters died at the tender age of twenty-one. Wow. And the, the timeline is something the movie's really s screwed up. With Professor Snape too, he's 33, 34 in the, in the book. Whilst he's actually, well, while he, while his actor was actually 60. Yeah, well, they did, they did try to de-age him quite a lot. Uh, but yes, uh, I have, I've heard this remark before actually, Howard. I thought it mentioned something about, um, the, the Potter's money in Philosopher's Stone when uh, when Harry goes to Gringotts for the first time. Obviously, uh, I'm, I, I'm not exactly remembering exactly what it was, though. I love the part when Harry just hangs out in Diagon Alley. Not much is happening, but all the descriptions and details make the Wizarding World feel so real. I love to the talking mirror. Uh, absolutely, me too. Absolutely. It's a moment where the story allows the world to breathe. And you need that, and it is a great moment. And I, again, I would refer to back with uh, with Harry staying with the Dursleys as well. It's a moment where the world really just set, starts to breathe after a lot has just happened. You know. Thank you very much for your comment. Uh, I'm just gonna have a look how many more we got, guys. Not that, not that is a problem. It's just oh, damn it. Uh, just so I can keep pace because we are over an hour. Oh, we, okay, we're, we're actually nearly there. Sandra. I love the way that Fred and George poke fun at Percy in Chapter 4. They're just so much more hilarious in the books. I also love how Sirius is mentioned so early on, even in the Muggle world as an escaped prisoner. That's so interesting to me, guys. Sorry about going into politics so much, but that is that that was something which I was not expecting. The, the Muggles to be talking about Black. So often details are woven into the story. So early on, you notice... It, you, you never notice, you never even notice at, at first read, absolutely. 
As someone who is not from the UK, could you, you maybe give us a clue on the different dialects Stephen Fry gives in certain characters? For example, what kind of dialect does Hagrid have? Um, or what, or what about Stan Shumpike? I must admit, I didn't listen to, to, to uh, Fry for these ones. I, I really should do so I can answer that. Uh, I, I'll get back to you on that. With Hagrid, I know he does do a pretty accurate Hagrid. And I think... Oh, correct me if I'm wrong, guys. I think that Hagrid's meant to have like a West Country sort of accent. So Cornwall, Devon sort of accent. Oh man, I hope I've got that right. I hope I've got that right. I apologize if if, if not, but which is uh which is west southwest. Uh yeah, the, 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 the little foot of, of uh, Great Britain. Um As for Stan, I don't know, I'm afraid. I will have to get back to you on that. I would imagine maybe. He sounds a bit cockney in, in the movie. Oh, what are you waiting for? The grass to grow. Yeah, I would say that is a Cockney. Well, not Cockney, because that's a very specific area of London, but um, uh, a Londoner, Londoner, I should say. For you to be a, re referred to as an actual Cockney, you have to be born within the sound of Bow Bells. So Bow Bells is a church, I think. And if you're going to... Oh, I might be getting this wrong. But if... When the bells ring, if you can hear those bells where you were born, where you were physically born, then, then that makes you a Cockney. Um, so I'll, I'll have to get back to you about Stan. I'm, I'm sorry about that, Sandra. But um, yeah, I mean, the thing is, a lot of people say that people from England all kind of sound the same, which is just insane to me, guys. But then again, it'd probably be the same talking about Americans. Uh, like saying that someone from... Um, well, I mean, I was going to say New York and L.A., but I'd imagine they probably do sound similar. But, you know, from, from the south and north, you know? Um, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Very interesting question, Sandra. Um, but, yes, uh, I, I'll listen to Stephen Fry's ones next time. The, the, the only thing which I'll say with Stephen Fry's is that they do tend to be longer, which should actually help me, actually, because, uh, because it gives me more time to write notes without pausing. Yeah. Okay. Either way, thank you very much for your, for your question, Sandra. Great question about the dialects. I, I will endeavour to try and help you on that. Uh, Max, the writer of the summaries, thank you so much again. The foreshadowing in the first two chapters is brilliantly written. You discover a lot when you know the rest of the book and reread it. That being said, I really wish Harry's time in Diagon Alley was shown in the movie. I would would be nice to see Happy Harry happy outside of Hogwarts. That's a lot of H's. Um, Triple H. Just like uh, his first visit to the borough. Well, there you go. There you go, Max. Exactly what I was referring to. Yeah, it's true. If I was to give a read, for, for one, in movie version, it does make sense that Fudge would not want Harry to be going out and about, even in Diagon Alley. Uh, two, also, you go, in movies... I do feel like they just had to keep the pace up and fast until getting to um, until getting to Hogwarts. Um, that being said, I would love to see it. DVD extra would be amazing. Would be amazing. Uh, thank you so much for your comment, Max. Yeah. I feel like there is so much in these first chapters that is e it's easy to miss out on some details that get important later on. Especially things the things we hear about Black, like him repeating... In his sleep, he's he's at Hogwarts. Also, he, we can already experience the shift from his from child children, ch children books to a more mature feeling. This can also be seen in the characters themselves, like Harry, who is being able to stand his ground in front of Vernon and try to to get allowance to visit Hogsmeade. On a side note, I found the development of Percy's, Percy extremely interesting. I, I completely agree. He is the only one he's only one of the Weasleys that really shows a growing ambition and love for law and order, contrary to rather chaotic but kind-hearted rest of the family. What about Bill? Was it Bill that was head boy or Charlie? I think it was Bill. I'm sorry if I'm, if I'm getting it wrong. Uh, one of them was head boy, definitely. Right? Oh, I think so, guys. I think so. I'm sorry if I got this wrong. You'd imagine that Percy probably idolised them. And wanted to hit that 
sort of height as well. But then, as he started to get older, started to look into other people who who uh, who were who who were hugely successful, like reading books about you know what was it prefects who gained power or something like that was mentioned in Chamber of Secrets. I'm loving Percy's stuff, guys. I really am. I never thought I was, uh, uh, that was going to be the case going into these books, but I really am. Um, Percy becoming head boy pushes him further away from things that the rest of his family care about. Maybe I'm wrong about Bill and Charles. I thought one of them was. Um, keep that in mind because it gets more important in the later books to understand Percy's motives. As always, thanks for you, your interest and profound thoughts on the books and greetings from Germany. Thank you so much. That's very kind of you to say. Well, I know that he joins the ministry because we had that one... I'm sure he's in it more, but it's like one scene where I noticed that he was in um, uh, Order of the Phoenix. Uh, when he's got, like, uh, Pumpkin Pasty and Harry, I think it is, isn't it? Um, is it Pumpkin Pasty? I feel like it's Pumpkin Pasty. We haven't met her yet either, guys. It's going to be very interesting when we hit uh, Goblet. Thank you so much, Pia. Or maybe she's going to be in this book. Loving a hat. Yay, Azkaban, finally. Poor Harry, though, having to spend a week with Marge instead of just a day. No wonder he snapped. It's better that in, in the book is is doing an essay and very worried about doing magic because of the, the, the warning last year. Hence why people are bringing up that first scene in the movie, yeah. Instead of how the movie, they had him straight away practicing Luma <laughs> under, uh, under, uh, um, under the covers. I guess it's because it looks cooler. That is also a big thing when, when making these movies, guys. It doesn't add much to the story-wise, but I would have loved to see Ron calling the Tursleys in the movie and shouting down the phone. Their faces would be uh, gorgeous. I can, I, vis I can see it. I can see it in my mind's eye, that scene. I really can. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, loving that. Um... I forgot how many clues that I give to Scabbers from the beginning. It's interesting reading it, knowing the story. Absolutely. Um, which is why I really need to make sure that I'm that I'm trying to avoid doing that myself. This is a small thing after hearing about Hermione's birthday. I could be wrong, but I don't think we ever in the series hear about Harry buying Ron or Hermione a birthday or Christmas presents. And it's always Hermione and Ron by buying Harry. He's the richest and gets most stuff as well, lol. I guess it's because it's not an important plot point, but I assume Harry must buy them gifts as well, even if it's not mentioned. I thought he did give give something to Ron in Philosopher's Stone. Not not a present, but he gave something to maybe not. You know what it is? Um, Love and a Hat. We are hearing the story from Harry's perspective. And what he's getting Ron and Hermione is going to be less important to him than what they're getting him. That is a stretch, I admit. Because you're right, there is a loophole there. Harry definitely gave Ron something about Ron's favourite Quidditch team last... No, that was the other way around. It was, Ron gave him a book about his favourite team. Very interesting point, Love and Hats. And it, 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 it's asking... For the first book, I can understand it. Uh, but going forward, yes, that will be strange. If like on Deathly Hallows, this <laughs> Ron and Hermione like, you literally never gave us a present, dude. <laughs> Very good point. Birthday wise, I think that's excusable because um, the birthdays can just pa can just pass by without any uh, important events happening on them. Christmas though, that is strange. Great point. Thank you very much for your comment. Last comment, and it is Sarah this time. Okay, so excited you for you so excited for you to ha have started these longer and more mature books that have more details and so much more that you have no way 
of knowing as just a movie watcher. Three questions. Let's knock them out. Uh, what was the most surprising thing from the first four chapters for you? Sirius Black being on the television was the was the biggest wait what like double double checking wait what just happened sort of moment. The the biggest ongoing thing is the permission slip. How important that is to the storyline it really is. Um, I'd say those two. The night bus scene was also wonderful. I love both the book and the movie night night bus scene, guys. I would say they're both as good as each other. Controversial, I know. Let me know if you do prefer one than the other. Um, I would say those two uh, examples that I just gave. Because I can understand them cutting the Diag Diagon Alley stuff. I, it's a shame that they did, but I can understand them doing it. So for surprise, literal surprise, I would say that it is the permission slip and also Sirius Black being on Muggle television. What character are you most excited and hopefully to get more information about more scenes with with going into this book? This book? Uh, yeah, this book, it's definitely Lupin. If you'd say to all the books, I would say probably Lupin as well. But I would absolutely have that Tonks in there. Absolutely. Uh, I'd have Pumpkin Pasty, quite frankly, because I've heard that she's very different in here. Uh, Cedric, Cedric. I hope the thing is the book is all from Harry's point of view. So I don't know if it's going to be quite negative on, on Cedric. <sighs> Serious, of course. But no, it, it, it is Lupin. It's, it, it, and as you say, specifically this book, it's Lupin. Guys. It really is. I, I love that character. I really do. And of course, Pettigrew is, as well, of course. But no, I'm, I'm going with uh, Lupin on that. Number three, what is your impression of Sirius as a character after, after reading about his crimes and him laughing, his laughing reaction to getting caught that we are told about Stan, by Stan and Ern when knowing what actually happened? Yeah, I'd imagine that he's under some sort of curse to make, to keep laughing and that someone else was the one who, who did the crime. Or maybe the crime didn't even... Oh, man. I mean, the thing is, I found him creepy at the start of Prisoner of Azkaban. I really did. But we're getting so much more information to make to, to find him creepy. Uh, a threat. Not creepy. I'm going to take that back. I, that, I feel like he's a real threat. Um, and the fact that Ron and Harry are kind of being a bit lackadaisical about him worries me. Yeah, that, that, that's my takeaway from it. Um, thank you very much for your questions. Uh, a few of my observations about these chapters. How are people still using the, uh, as long as Albus Dumbledore is there, nothing bad can happen to Harry line when Harry has shown, has now been attacked at the end of two out of two, <laughs> two, two out of two years at Hogwarts. Come on, Molly, make me laugh. It makes me laugh every time. It's true she's really throwing it out there, isn't she? Man, I guess you may not know the full story of what happened at Hogwarts those two years. Obviously, she she, she did know to an extent with Chamber because she was actually there at the end. Um, two. Stop flying, Errol. Stop flying, Errol Weasley family. It's just abusive at this point and no... No, and one of these days is going to kill the poor owl. Especially looking looking at you, Ron. This uh, also looking at you, Harry Potter. What? You, <laughs> I want to use all your money to buy them a new owl, and they and they won't die if used. No. Okay then. I was going to say that maybe Errol's proud and wouldn't want another owl to be take over but I think, they would be, I think it'd be absolutely fire of it the tying around the leg thing was a note where I'm thinking oh okay so this isn't an option for the owl this really is an option for the owl this is uh this is yeah a bit strong great point I love the fact you refer to Harry Harry Potter as well Potter as the slivering say um number three uh, how does Arthur Weasley not know how to use a telephone? His job is is muggle relations. He is a, he's supposed 
to be a muggle expert whose job requires a lot of con Contact with muggles, yet he's never seems to actually know anything about muggle things. Maybe he's maybe he's patronizing Harry. But then again, he doesn't tell Ron how to do it properly either, does he? So no, he wouldn't be patronizing Harry. It's yeah, that's a fair point. You, you know what? You, you do have a point there, Sarah. That that is a, a a bit of a plot hole. Makes for his makes for a funnier character though. And also, maybe he's just not very good at his job as well. There is also that. Um, <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that is a very fair point. Um, my favourite Hedwig theory is that the reason Hedwig... Uh, oh, there's Errol, by the way. There he is. Smashing into the uh, thing. Uh, you can now send me stuff via mailbox, uh, PO box, guys. And so uh, I've posted a video on that so you can check out the information in that video if you so wish. Uh, my favourite theory... Hedwig theory is that the reason reason Harry keeps getting Essie gifts from the Dursleys is that Hedwig flies flies to collect a gift from them every year, just as she went to Hermione to to get the birthday gift in, in the in these chapters, and that the Dursleys send some Essie's things because she uh, because she won't leave them. Sorry, I'm. I'm t reading this badly you guys does he just send essy things because she because she won't leave without a gift of some kind such a sweet and loyal pet and harry doesn't appreciate her nearly enough maybe maybe that's it it's like okay maybe henry actually talks when harry's around it's like he's like okay guys you better come up with a good present here <laughs> yeah, I really like that. I was throughout the first couple of movies saying, when's Hedwig going to speak? I actually really was. I was fully expecting Hedwig, 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 Hedwig to speak. Great point, though. That's amazing. Uh, sorry it got so long, but the, these are just so many th things to ask at, at this point. And that's okay, Sarah. Uh, I would say that it is it is bordering on the, on the longer side, but I don't want to... If you've got something to say then say it in, in the comments, guys. Um, like I say, I do have certain rules, but that's just so we can keep these going, you know, to, to, keep, to keep them flowing. Just the book club itself has been an hour and a half uh, in this video. I'm fine with that, but I it's just so we can get through it and everything. And, so, and also, we covered four chapters today, so it, it, naturally your comments would be longer. So I'm going to leave it there, guys. Thank you all so much for watching. This has been a epic one this is most definitely going to be the longest video so far but that does make sense because it's four chapters um and the book club is so huge now hour and a half just in your comments guys i thoroughly i'm very happy it's my favorite part of doing these really is finding out all your thoughts and your questions and everything love every single one of you i'm gonna pop off now uh yes that's all i got to say <laughs> probably back to three chapters next time probably and we're most definitely going to be meeting lupin and i cannot bloom and wait for that please subscribe all this stuff i'm Gamer, and i'll see you next time